Hey everyone, welcome to Game Face, episode 227 on Sifted Games at Sifted.net, the world's most advanced gaming website. We're here live on Twitch to talk about the biggest topics in gaming for the past seven days. We're here every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. I'm Shane Satterfield. You can find me on Twitter at Dinfire. And alongside me today, I have Matthew Kyle. What's up, Matt? Uh, you know, every day blends into the next in a long gray stretch. So inherently Kafka-esque that I wake up every morning mildly surprised that I haven't turned into a cockroach. <laughs> I mean, hey, I'm great. How you doing? Fair enough. Uh, you can find, if you want to hear more comedic stylings of Matt Kyle, you can find him on Twitter at mkyle. That's M-K-E-I-L. Uh, on shower duty today, running the TriCaster, we got Jared. What's up going on, Jared? How are you, man? I'm good. How are you? Hanging in there, man. You keeping busy? Uh, yeah, I have a few jobs going on. I just finished Last of Us 2. and uh... Wait, wait, wait. Oh, you mean the game? Yeah. Yeah. What'd you think? Uh, it's it's uh, uh still processing all that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot to process. Yeah, I think I like it more in uh, memories than I did playing it, maybe because it was it was a lot to do. But it was a great yeah. game. I'm just uh, yeah, I haven't started anything else yet. You're not alone on that one. That game has been very polarizing pretty much across the industry. Uh, and pretty much everyone has agreed that it's not an easy play, no matter whether you like it or not. It can be tough to get through with some of the content in there. For yeah, sure. even my me and my friend who uh, called, is, considers it her favorite game of all time had to like put it down and step away for a couple of like she's like, I'm not going to play New Game Plus for a very long time. <laughs> oh, like, wow. It's a it's a. I mean, it's it's a journey. It is. It grinds you. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. And that's one of the things with doing what we do is we can't take that moment and step mm -hmm. away. But as you do it years and years, you learn to kind of calibrate uh, based upon that, um, knowing that you're playing it a little differently than most people. And I think you kind of calibrate your opinions based upon that kind of stuff. So it all works out in the end. At least I believe it does. Uh, we do have a couple notes before we get started. First of all, Sifted's Fantasy Football League is full. Uh, we lost one player, and I was a little bummed about it. Bentley left the league. He's been in the league since the beginning. Um, but he did say that he has a really busy Q4, and he just didn't think he was going to have time for it. So um, in his place, Sifter Get Up Kid is the new member of the Sifted Fantasy Football League. Uh, our draft is on Monday on Labor Day at like 11 a.m. or something my time. Um, I have four fantasy football drafts in five days starting on Friday. <laughs> so I have one Friday, I have one Saturday, I have one Monday, and I have one Tuesday. Because a lot of people just weren't going to do it. I think people are just bummed out with what's going on and they just kind of procrastinated. So every league I'm in has just kind of reactivated in the last like three days. They're like, I'm going to do it. So it's a crazy year. It, you know, it's funny how stuff like what's going on in the world right now changes your perspective on things that you have loved for years and years. And that's happened for a lot of people with fantasy and a lot of other stuff. But that's the world we're living in right now, people. Um, one last note. So I had said last week that we were doing a very special episode of Pactor Factor that was supposed to happen tomorrow, uh, Thursday the 3rd. Unfortunately, it has been pushed back. Uh, there's a lot... I don't want to spoil too much until we really announce it, but there's a lot of technical hurdles that we're jumping through to make it happen. And Pactor works from home and he works for Wedbush and his computer at home has crazy firewalls and VPN and all this stuff that we're having problems jumping through. So anyway, we're working on it. It is coming, uh, but it is going to be delayed. It is not happening tomorrow. I feel terrible for kind of activating you guys and telling you, uh, to make sure you're available for tomorrow. But unfortunately, it was completely out of my hands. It was hard scheduled for tomorrow, and it has been bumped. So just wanted to fill you guys in on what's going on there. Uh, we're ready for the show. We have some big stuff in today's show. We're going to talk about Gamescom 2020, as it were. Uh, we're going to talk about Marvel's Avengers. Um, Matt has been playing the crap out of that. Um, but before we do, here's a word from our sponsor. Do you live life outdoors? The Shazer Ryan Realty has a nice level lot just outside of Libby, Montana that's perfect for you. With access to Crystal Lake via shared dock and boat ramp, it's an ideal location to build the getaway home of your dreams or just park your RV. Enjoy fishing, paddleboarding, kayaking, boating, and more just a few steps away. It can be yours for just $72.5. No matter where you live, contact Doug DeShazer at 406-291-1643 or deshazermt at gmail.com. 
Even if you're not looking for property in Montana, he can connect you with local realtors in your area who can help you. If you want to see more, head over to DeShazerRyanRealty.com. That's DeShazerRyanRealty.com. Big thanks to DeShazer Ryan Realty. As you can see, they're back for another month. Again, makes a gigantic difference for us. So we really, really appreciate it. Next, we're going to talk about- I do need a property with a dock. Yeah. Or you can just roll your RV up in there and just park it and live in like outdoor paradise. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying I'd like to live somewhere with a jetty. It's a, it's... Yeah, yeah. It would be nice to live somewhere where you just walk outside your door and there's a, a lake and a mm-hmm. dock. Uh, you would never, ever be bored. Uh, so anyway- Check it out. Get in touch with Doug DeShazer in, if you're looking for property anywhere, not just in Montana. All right, let's get to the poll of the week. This week's poll of the week was a playoff of a topic that Matt and I discussed in episode 226. Uh, we were talking about all digital and going all digital. And so I asked you guys, I'll go all digital when dot, dot, dot. And there were four options in the poll. And This one was kind of a landslide for two of the options. So there were four options. The first was, I'll go all digital when they stop making physical games and I'm forced to. The second option was, I'll go all digital when there's no longer a viable secondhand market. The third option was, I'll never go all digital. I'll stop playing games altogether if that happens. That's the nuclear option. Um, And then the final option was, of course, I'm already all digital. Um, And now we can reveal the results of the poll Uh, winning, I wouldn't say in a landslide, but winning pretty handily was the first option. Um, I'll go all digital when they stop making physical games and I'm forced to 46% of the vote, uh, went to that option. Matt, are you surprised by that at all? No, I mean, that's what I would have voted for. Yeah. You didn't Um, vote this week? I didn't see it. Like the the thing up top, I think still said the Epic thing last I looked, but that might have been been, been, six days. (laughs) Might've been me not, my browser not refreshing the page. That could be. Um, but, um, it, it was the most voted poll we've ever had, the most voted poll of the week we've ever had. So this is something that you guys are very passionate about, for sure. But like, I mean, yeah, I mean, I still buy, I buy 90% digital, but I do buy physical games when it comes to games that I want to like collect or have on the shelf or that I care about. Um, so yeah, I mean, technically my pick would have to be, I will stop when they stop making them. Okay. Um, the second most popular pick, and again, not a big surprise, was I'm already all digital. And 43% of you replied with that, which falls pretty much in line with a lot of the data that we've seen. Pactor generally says it's he thinks it's like 50-50. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you look at like super data and, and MPD and stuff like that, they generally say it's a little lower than that. So 43% sounds about right. A little bit lower than the average also sounds about right because we do have a lot of really hardcore gamers on our site that are collectors and things like that. So I wasn't surprised by that response at all. What about you? No, I mean, I think that sounds about right. Like, um, honestly, I think the more surprising uh, statistic is the secondhand one um, because you'd think that one of the reasons, I mean, but there's probably overlap between the, the physical yeah. games one and the I almost, secondhand market. I almost so. didn't include that option, but I want, I did want to include it to provide a little bit of nuance to kind of both sides of the coin. Mm-hmm. Um, cause we had kind of two that was on one side and only one on the other. So I figured I'd slide that in there, but you're right. Um, it's not very scientific. Um, and it does, there is overlap with that. And, uh, when they no longer make physical games, totally get it. Um, and then, as Matt mentioned, uh, the secondhand market disappears. I got 10% of the vote. And then never, I'll quit gaming if physical media disappears. Just two people <laughs> mm. picked it. Um, just 1% of the vote. So, so it's, it's not that much right. of a diehard issue yeah, when yeah. it comes down to it. Because like, people aren't willing to kind of push the nuclear button. Right. Um, and look, if, yeah, you, we have, if you use Steam, you're already there. Yeah. And that was, and now we're going to get to some of the responses. That was a very common response uh, from sifters in the comments was that I've been all digital since like mid aught because mm-hmm. I'm a PC gamer and I've been using Steam. So for these people, and I guess they probably made up a big part of that 43% as well. Uh, but we do have some quotes to kind of represent the gamut of what you guys were saying about this from Francis Alex. He says, I still buy most of my games physical, except for the ones I want to have easy access to on my console without having to change discs, which are not very many. Right now, my perspective is mostly shifting thanks to what Game Pass is offering on Xbox. Interesting. I have never owned one, but for this gen, I plan to eventually buy both the PS5 and the Series X. And for Microsoft exclusives and the many really good indie games that I know are out there and I haven't played. Um, So here's a case where going digital has actually convinced someone 
to go multi-platform this gen and get both consoles, which is great. And we recommend that every time. We say it over and over. If you can afford it, get all the consoles so you're not buying kind of B-tier games on the one console that you own. Microsoft want to get Mike might want to get an interview with him to uh, yes, to throw in their Xbox Series X announcement pr- or, presentation or fly him in for like their launch extravaganza or whatever. So I mean that's that's what you want to hear from mm-hmm. someone. Uh, it, you know the evangelizing is working. Xbox Game Pass is working. Uh, next up from NZZ, he or she says, uh, I always price compare between digital, new physical, or secondhand physical. So if games go all digital, as long as the secondhand physical market has competitive prices. I can always buy physical if it's a value. I think that's the danger, is that we don't see as many discounts on digital as you would hope. Anyway. I think um, you do, though. I you think, do? Well, yeah. you have to hunt. Yeah, you have to find them, though. And I mean, I don't, I, don't, shot, I don't think so. I, I think it helps, obviously. but I think it's way easier to find crazy discounts on digital stuff than, re- than physical stuff. And, and, you know, the biggest physical discounts I would find would be, like, either use things or... You know, back when a generation would end, you used to be able to kind of go around to the stores and and like everything would be kind of on clearance because they knew like there were no more PS2 games ever coming in. So they're trying to clear out the bins like Jason Chung and I did that when we first moved to L.A. in 2004 was we we would sweep the city's DVD <laughs> and, and like game yeah. stores and just sort of clear them out of like weird little like oddball stuff titles. Or something. Yeah. yeah. Or just things we wanted to play and didn't want to pay 50 bucks for. So right. we go but nine ninety nine. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I have a lot of my PS2 games back there from that those shopping trips. But like, I you know, meanwhile, like if I go on you know Xbox Live about half the time, you can get like Breakpoint for fifteen bucks. You know, it's like it's I don't. It's just, you know, I think it's hard to keep track of where you're going to get the discounts. Um, I think we, that's more of a uh, a factor of whether or not the storefronts are easy to navigate. Like that's on them. That's true. More that's than us, well. I think. Yeah. You know, like like Steam, yeah. vast amounts of my Steam library because like they just randomly threw up something that like I was vi- vaguely interested in and it cost four ninety nine. I'm like, sure, that can go in the cart. Go for it. You know, impulse buy. Yeah, yeah impulse buy is at like a certain price level are like you know and then like you play it for like an hour and it's fun and it's fine you never look at it again but yeah, it's you're like, five I bucks. spent five bucks like that's, that's worth the price an hour of a coffee like Absolutely. who cares uh, continuing on with NZZ's comment, he says, or she says, uh, my purchase and choice of format depends on where game prices and my interest intersect. Back in the day, I thought I would care more about physical going away, but I rarely buy physical now unless it is for older gen consoles in my collection. Mm-hmm. I think that probably is most representative of the sifter and ZZ's comment. That sounds um, about right. Yeah. And like, look, I, you know, I'm glad I have my old physical stuff around for certain, you know, like I played yeah. rogue, I played rogue leader the other day, you know, on my nice. GameCube. <laughs> my, my wave bird is dead. It my just doesn't bird, work. My wave bird just doesn't work anymore. Wow. You know, so Mine just it. is yellow. <laughs> it's Mine like, is a little yellow too. <laughs> yeah. But like, but that wave bird came from that. You remember that E3, you could spin the wheel. And yeah, we, yeah. I, that's what I got. I, I won a wave no bird. Way. Yeah, and it wheel. didn't last. They and must have been used I like mean, the second like run ones or something for that. I mean, that thing is like 19 years old. So yeah, it did, it did okay. Um, yep. I ordered a new one from eBay. It'll be here soon. But I decided right. to play, I had to play it wired. How much if, was that wave bird on eBay, Matt? 24. Curiosity. That's 24 bucks. The Wavebird controllers are not that expensive. The expensive thing is the receiver. I wonder why. I don't could probably because people lose them. Uh, I would think. Um, but I have my receiver. That's fine. And that always that is even more yellow than the Wavebird. <laughs> uh, but it still works. So I just need a Wavebird that turns on. Gotcha. Um, but I had to I had to dig into my bins and find one of the wired GameCube controllers and yeah. uh, which is pristine. But I, I, don't I think have I've ever all used my it. GameCube controllers look brand um, new. <laughs> no one played uh, them with me. Had to play, had to play it with a with a wire controller like a peasant. <laughs> it's been a while, right? I don't I don't miss that. I'll tell you that much. Uh, and then the final comment comes from Jake three one zero three, and he's kind of on the other end of the spectrum. He says, "I hate clutter, so I'm all digital." A few yeah. years ago, I got so fed up with the clutter, I donated all of my physical games, CDs, and books to charity. My yearly statement from the charity store on that first year said that they made over a thousand pounds or a thousand euro from selling my items. That's pretty crazy. That made me feel really good. And now my home looks clean too. I love that. That's that's amazing, Jake. Um, and I would recommend if you guys are going to do what Jake did, do the same thing. Donate it someplace where people can get some good out of it. Um, or sell it and make money. <laughs> I, I will admit I have, a, I have a box like half the size of me uh, in the garage that's just full of physical PC games wow. that I have replaced digitally. 
Um, Those are I, really hard to keep because, yeah. dude, their boxes are huge. Huge. They're, they're loaded with all this crap. They, if you stack them, mm. they like fold and like collapse yeah and then well then all, like a lot of them are also those like you know remember those like thick dvd case yeah, things yeah, the they used to have yeah ones yeah like, a lot of them doom, are those i have doom three i think in that old plastic it, it, they Tons weigh like five pounds. so many sims three expansions oh, yeah. like just it doesn't end so like all that's digital now so i'm just like why Bye -bye. But, but i don't know what to do with it like this is like no one no used places you know amoeba is just like go away like yeah. <laughs> nobody wants used pc games well amoeba's so, closed now too and they're moving yeah. from yeah. their location here in hollywood um i also and then i have another box almost as big full of mac versions of games from the 90s and, and early 2000s which i'm like who who needs system 7.5 <laughs> alien versus predator for mac who's no one. let's go no one needs it I, the only thing i can think is that maybe there's those guys that like archive everything like archive game code and like maybe they'd want the Mac version code just to like for completism's sake. I'm like, I need to hit up like some game museums and see if they want those. That, that's the only possible place I could think that would want those. Some of that stuff really is just throw it out. Like I have a bunch of those unopened Sims expansion, Sims 3, where mm -hmm. they put out like a separate jewel case just for an expansion. Never open, just sitting there. Like even I like the ones that are just like clothes yeah like it's, it's not even like a real expansion it's like a stuff pack you they know, still like, released it to retail it's really yeah. crazy what they did with the sims uh but anyway uh thank you guys for participating in our poll of the week next week's poll will be up here in the next couple days obviously look in the header for that uh again this is also the most commented poll of the week on the site so thank you guys very much for participating and getting involved and taking the moment uh to leave thoughtful comments i'm trying to get all you guys in the show um, it's been pretty cool. We're seeing a lot of people popping up uh, in the comments that aren't very active on the site, which I really love. It's really good to see. Uh, but I'm trying to get all you guys on the show. So stay patient. Eventually, I think I'll get you guys all in. Um, and with that, it is time to kick off the show for reals. Uh, and we're going to kick things off with a game that I have not played any more of since we talked about it last. But Matt sure has Marvel's Avengers. Uh, the game basically came out for pre-orders on Monday night, Tuesday. Everybody else has to wait until Friday. I got review code for it this morning, so I haven't got to play any extra from where we did in the beta. But Matt, you have started, you started on Monday night, and you mm -hmm. told me before the show you're almost done. So Almost done with the, with the main campaign. Okay, here's the other thing I want to say before we start talking about this. So... We are outliers. We were outliers on this game from the beta. Um, I don't know mm. if you've realized it or not, but we yeah, were saw. we were one of the few people who were positive on mm -hmm. the game after the beta. And look, a lot of stuff has happened with this game since then. Um, you know, we were getting DLC characters for free, but we found out that you're going to have to pay for the battle pass for each one of those characters. That may have tied into some people's sort of lack of interest in this game. But overall, we seemed to enjoy it more than the average journalist, at least, or at least the average internet person uh, from the beta. So with all that in mind, having just finished it, what do you think is the one thing that pops to, to your mind first when I say, what has changed your opinion the most from the beta to final game? Um, probably presentation. Okay. Which does not surprise me because I thought it would, here's the thing. So I did look at a lot of beta impressions. And one thing I have noticed is that the press and a lot of like public impressions are coming around to our side of things. Okay. Uh, with, with, you know, like Patrick Klepek and, and Kotaku has been posting some, like they're basically like, this game's great and we didn't see it coming kind of thing. Okay. All right. Um, because part of it is I knew for, cer for certain there was a lot of stuff missing in the beta in mm -hmm. terms of like presentational connective tissue because they weren't trying to, they weren't trying to bore you. They want to get you thro throw you into combat situations. They want to throw you into not necessarily matchmaking situations, which still doesn't work even in the really. Yeah, I mean it's Ooh. not out yet. T minus three days and counting. But uh, it's that huh. still doesn't work any better than it did in the beta. I mean it doesn't oh, matter if you're boy. trying to do uh, campaign stuff. I have not played the multiplayer only stuff, the Avengers Initiative, because when you start the Avengers Initiative option, that's a separate menu option from campaign. And apparently the cutscene that starts that uh, spoils the end of the campaign because <laughs> it takes place after the campaign. That, you just saved a lot of people, Matt. <laughs> um, so be aware of that. Uh, I mean, it, uh, I don't think the end is going to shock anybody since the story is basically about reassembling the Avengers 
Uh, and if anyone thinks Cap is going to stay dead, you're crazy and never read a comic book before. But um, <laughs> basically, like, yeah, play the campaign first. And the campaign is pretty long. But like, but as I expected, um, it does not just immediately start with the Avengers stopping the attack on the Golden Gate Bridge. It starts with you playing as Ka- Kamala Khan, Ms. Marvel, uh, at the Avengers Expo thing. Uh, walking around to each booth and meeting the Avengers briefly and talking to people like it's it's She's very a fan girl right yeah but it's adorable like it's really nice like there's a, there's tons of, of deep cut like Marvel references in it um, there's a bunch of stuff that explains why certain things are different in this version of the universe like one of my questions was like what's up with Cap's shield like how can it do all this crazy stuff uh, other than like it makes for more interesting combat in a video game, and the answer is right there on the in the in the Captain America booth at this thing. Uh, it's the sh- it's not the original shield. It's one that was designed by Shuri in Wakanda uh, with all these like crazy new properties and and tech stuff in it. So like it's it's got like Wakanda tech in it. That's why it's so more advanced can do all these weird things. Interesting, um, which is great. Um, there's just things like that all through it, and like the interaction she has are really, really nice. Here's here's the other thing. Like as I was going through this game further and further, I was like, especially near the end of like kind of the act two, the all is lost moments. Mm-hmm. I was like, this is really good. Like the performances are are good. Like this, the characters are true to each other. Like the conflicts are believable. Like what's going? On? And I, I so I started doing some digging about who made this thing. Is it? Mm-hmm. It's, it didn't feel like the normal Crystal Dynamics, even though Crystal Dynamics does it's do pretty, pretty good. good work in general. Yeah. So the guy, so the the writer and the writer director of this game is the writer and creative director of Uncharted Lost Legacy and was the cine, one of the lead cinematics directors for uh, Last of Us 2. So he came from Naughty Dog, which explains a lot. Like there's a lot of, you can see that pedigree here. And then the combat, which I think we both liked a lot more yeah. than we thought we would in the, in the, the beta, that's by uh, the, the combat director for this game is the combat director from God of War. What? Like they actually? I didn't even know he left. They, neither did I. Like they, I, they headhunted a dream team for this one. Basically, wow, so I why? No so idea. why does Thor feel so good and so much like playing Kratos? Because the guy who designed Kratos <laughs> made him. Like wow. that's why. So like, so there's there's some pedigree on this thing. Like they assembled they assembled a, a, an Avengers team. They of their really own did assemble a, a good team. Um, and that is really the the upshot. Like the, the the campaign is solid. Like it's a good Avenger story. It's a really good Kam, Kam, Kamala Khan story because she's the main character. You do play as everybody over the course of the of the game, but she is the protagonist for sure. Um, and it's uh, there's a lot of really nice stuff in it. Uh, any Avengers, other co-stars? Any other Avengers that end up getting a little more screen time than others that kind of stand out? Maybe. Um, I mean. Uh, Banner and Tony are okay. kind of they're from the, they're there from the be- more from the beginning, so you see a lot more of them. Mm-hmm. Um, Widow and Thor show up much later. Uh, Thor's presence has been very minimal. Uh, Interesting. Like, like if you remember that demo where Thor shows up in the t-shirt and smashes the the robots on the yeah. on the carrier deck that was that they did a while ago. Yeah. Um, that's like. 80% of the way through the game, and that's his first playable appearance since the Golden Gate Bridge. Wow. So if you're a big Thor fan... <laughs> you're going to be waiting. You're going to be waiting for this one, yeah. Is, um, but um, there's a lot to it. I mean, in terms of the, the star of the show beyond that, if you know, beyond the kind of the, the, the cinematic stuff, you know, it doesn't matter if the, if the gameplay is not good, and the gameplay is just as good as it was. Uh, one thing to note is, like, you can see there the skill tree of the primary skill tree there. There are two more pages of skill trees in the what? final game. So the primary thing you see there is all that stuff. And then there's a secondary skill tree that has is full all the way across the thing. And there's three or four things and they're all modifiers for your heroic abilities. Wow. So and there's so there's three modifiers, one for each heroic ability, you know, R, you know L1, R1, and both together. And then there's a separate section for like signature move stuff where you can just sort of modify things they can do in terms of how they're... So those are all modifier things. So what you wow. do with those is... Each tree for the, the the heroic moves, you can once you go down a couple and you level up, I think to level fifteen or twenty, I can't remember what. It unlocks these other th- so they're specializations. So you have these two sides for each move, and you unlock each. And once you unlock one side, that unlocks three things below it, and you can switch between those three enhancements at will for that move. 
So like I have one, like I'm the Hulkbuster uh, move on Iron Man. I have the one thing unlocked and op- opens three options. And I think one of them is like a specially charged laser and the other is more damage on something. And the other is like five, lo- five seconds longer in Hulkbuster mode. So I have it on five seconds longer, that kind of thing. And then there's an extra tree that I haven't even unlocked, a third thing that opens even more stuff, uh, which are more sort of like special, even more specialized sort of like perk things. Um, so there's you'll be you'll be adding skill point things to these characters and modifying them for a very long time if you stick with these characters. As I understand, I think the level cap might be 150. Wow! Um, Holy crap! So uh, I think the I, I might be wrong on this because I've only been reading stuff vaguely, but I think the level cap's 150 and the power because the power is the uh, the you know the, the gear you have equipped. It's like I think destiny. the power cap is 300. Okay. Um, and then that's not even accounting like all the gear stuff you can buy and unlock and the, the upgrade things that you get all the separate various currency things for. So there is a lot here. There's, there's, you know, for if you're worried the fact that like you kind of filled out that skill tree by the end of playing the demo, like not, e- not even a third of what's in there for each character. Now you said that you're near the end of the game, or at least you believe you are. How much have you filled out those trees? Have you reached, have you filled them um, up? Not as much as in the demo, no. Okay. Because, because uh, I haven't focused on one character very much because I've mostly been just sort of head, headlong can you? rushing. Uh, I mean, you can't you can if you branch off and do like the one-off missions on the war table, you know, like, okay. like that. Because there's the campaign trail through the whole campaign. Right. And then each character, as you re- they rejoin the Avengers, gets a little solo quest chain that you can go through. And when you finish that, they get uh, their iconic comic book outfit. Ah. Uh. People that's are going to be playing those. <laughs> that's another thing to note is everybody has a ton of outfits. Like, you know, you saw some in the demo, but I would say each each character, I think, has, God, I would say about almost 40 different wow. outfits. Uh, and some of them are unlocked through, um, you know, completing campaign or story things. Some are unlocked by finding patterns in the world and you take them back to the, carrier, the helicarrier and you can unlock them through the fabrication thing, which takes resources. Uh, there are some that are sold in the store, uh, for kind of microtransaction money, but you can also unlock those through um, doing what are called challenge cards for each hero. Like each hero has like a little series of mini quests, like, you know, defeat this many enemies with this move or, you know, things mm-hmm. like that. You know, daily challenges and weekly challenges. And as you finish those, you level up their challenge thing. And as you get to certain levels on that, that will unlock those those outfits that are otherwise sold on the on the microtransaction store. So if you stick with a character long enough and complete those, you never have to pay for them with real money if you don't want to. Um, and it's also got other stuff on it, but that is the main, you know, there's, there's everything they sell on the, on the real money store is also available if you kind of level up the challenge uh, cards on an individual character. So it's, it's, the, it's the usual thing of like, do you want to spend time playing or do you want to just, you know, jump to spending real money for this thing? But I have not seen anything that is not available except for real money, if, if you know what I mean. Okay. Like, there's there's nothing available it. that you can only pay real money for. Right. I, I haven't seen anything that's only available for the microtransaction bucks, basically. So that's good you, can, to hear. you can earn everything uh, in game if you don't want to do that. Um, I'm not going to promise how long that will take. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, principle of the thing, I guess. Um and then you do get um, uh, basically other in-game currency stuff that can be used. To, and there's a there's a vendor that sells those things, those store things for in-game currency that is not paid for with real money that's earned by doing missions. Okay. So you, you'd have to wait for that, whatever you want to come up in the rotation at that store. But if it did, you could buy it with in-game stuff that is not paid for with real money either. So there's a couple routes to that if you're worried about the microtransaction thing. Obviously, the new character battle pass thing is a whole separate Yep. problem um so so yeah uh but I, in general like the combat has just gotten better like you know now, now, I've, as you know, played it more things. you've enjoyed it more is that what you're saying yes definitely and I've, I've gotten better at like balancing some balancing like kind of you know the longer combos with things i understand uh more like, now that i've seen more varied enemies later in the game like i understand so they, they throw stuff at you that you're like okay you have to learn this mechanic it was fun before, but now you have to learn how to do this or they're going to destroy you. And and the interesting thing is there's a couple of trials by fire on that because when you when a new character joins, like you know, you're playing you you know, you're playing the campaign, go to, oh now Black Widow's here. You gotta play Black Widow for the first time. Black Widow's level one. The other the enemies you're fighting are level ten. What? They're like they're the they're the difficulty level of kind of like where you are in the campaign, but you and you can handle them. 
but you better be paying Being attention. Pretty good. Yeah. Um, and I didn't have a huge amount of trouble with it, but like there was one fight with her in her first mission where I'm like, these guys can kill me in like three hits. So I so got to be get real fast. I got, <laughs> oh, I got to wow. be real good with it and use, use your special moves. Like it's not, you know, you will, they will intentionally put you in situations where like, you got to use your heroic abilities. You can't do that. Thing. I, you know, I'm a I'm a player that tends to like to use my my standard moves to get through stuff and not Me too. use stuff my supers. Yeah. Kind of thing. I, a lot of times I just forget to use them. <laughs> and like you can probably do that in this game if you are really good at things. But like you know, and I'm decent at it, I think. But there's a point at which like I'm level three, they're level ten. There's four of them. I got to use the widow's bite. Yeah, you know, like yeah. there's no way yep. around it. How so, does the game flow, Matt? Because again, we played the beta and it, they gave us way more content than we ever thought, but it was all kind of patchwork. It's like the first level you play was like from the end of the game. The next level was from like the beginning. Now that you've played the fully assembled game, ha ha. Hmm. Well, nothing, nothing you played in the beta is from anywhere near the end of the game. Okay. You, the the beta is the first three missions, basically. Oh, okay. Um, okay. So, the, so when, so the, basically, you get that opening with Kamala, then you get the the tutorial with the Golden Gate Bridge and everything, and then you have some stuff with Kamala where you're you're you have to figure things out and you meet Bruce and you know obviously there's a bunch of stuff missing between the Golden Gate Bridge thing and being in the woods with Bruce looking for the aim base. Yeah. Um, so there's a whole thing in there. It's like, it's like an hour or so of gameplay there, the connective tissue there, um, maybe a little more actually. Uh, and where, you know how you find the Kamala carrier and that kind of thing. The, the, basically, the, the the beta is just jumping you to the action scenes. Right, it's cutting out all the downtime um, essentially. And so you do, then you do the mission, you know, there with the Hulk and, and Kamala that ends with the fight with the Abomination from the beta. And then you go back to the helicarrier and then you do that last mission where you're trying to find Jarvis's thing to to you know find Tony. And then in the beta, it just sort of like gives you all the war table missions and says, okay, go nuts. And the, so after that, in the in the real game. Um, the campaign just continues from there. So okay. every time you do like a campaign mission that brings you back to uh, the helicarrier or a home base kind of thing, you can go pick whatever you want to do. And usually there, there's like random missions. Like there's also like factions, you know, like any MMO kind of games is like Disney thing. There's factions. There's a shield faction and a, a Hank Pym faction and like a couple things. And they'll give you like, you know, daily challenges or whatever, where you can pick up as many as you want, and like you, you pick up this many items of this kind, or you defeat this many, and then you get faction points and level them up, and then you can buy other. You know, basically they sell equipment and and give you resources that you can then use to build other things. So um, what are you saying is the flow is entirely up to you because yeah. there's so many options so, at the war table that you can just decide whatever yeah. path you want to go. And in the campaign, like once you do a campaign mission, when you know how in, in the in the beta you came out of a mission and it showed you all the things you got, and then you could either like go straight to the war table or go back to the helicarrier. Yep. So in the campaign, you can either stay on the on the on the the ship and look at the war table and pick a new mission, or there's an option that says continue campaign. Oh, okay. And it just throws you right into the next campaign mission. So if you want to just go straight through the campaign and never do a side thing, you absolutely can. And um, there's a couple places where you'll play it, and it's, and like you'll see like the campaign mission is like one or two or three levels higher than your level. Don't worry about that. Like you're, you'll be fine. Like okay. it'll give you, it'll give you, it'll give you gear that brings you up to the level of the level of that mission pretty fat, pretty early on. Like I've, I found. So I've never had a problem where I felt like I was under leveled for the campaign. So if you want to just go straight through the campaign, go back and do the solo stuff and the war table stuff and the the faction stuff later, you absolutely can. Like there's no, there's no gateway on that really. That's very helpful. Um, so you say you're near the end of the game, or you think yeah. you are. How long is it? Well, I am, I'm definitely near the end because, like, if you look at the objective screen, they show each thing has its own little little window. Uh -huh. And so it says, like, you know, the campaign has its own little window there. And the little bar under it is, like, 90% full. Okay. So I'm getting close. I, I think it said I've done, like, 27, 27 missions or something That's like that. That's a lot. Um, I'm going to say it's, like, 12 hours long. Okay. Like, it's 10, 12 hours long. How do you um, feel about that? You think that's fine. long I, enough? Yeah. I mean, I, I am kind of ready to get on with it, like, because you're sort of building up to reforming the Avengers, and I'm kind of ready to, like, start doing some more freeform stuff at this point. Um, but I do want to see how it ends, and I want to unlock everybody, and I want to, you know, kind of get there and, and be able to play the, the Avengers Initiative stuff and see what that's all about. Um, and I want to do all the solos. I haven't done any of the solo quest lines. For the um, characters, for the, for the characters, yeah. So there's a lot to do still. Like there's 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 no shortage of solo content here. And are there cinematics in those? Are they fully fleshed out campaigns for the solo character stuff? I don't know. I haven't done any of them. Okay. Um, 
that's a little concerning to me, 12 hours. Um, and the reason I am concerned about it is because the other part of the game, the rest of the game, what you're going to do after you finish the campaign was not as fun or interesting to me. Um, it's more of like your traditional game as a service. Everyone's out in this kind of open world. Uh, there's waypoints that pop up. You run to the waypoint, complete the mission, run to the next waypoint. I, I, I'm not as excited about that as I was about kind of the curated and kept campaign that I got to play through in the beta. So hearing it's 12 hours roughly is a little concerning to me when you're talking about buying it full price, considering I'm I mean, not... That's a I mean, that's how long just about everything is campaign wise these days. So uh, I don't know. Um, it seems that uh, I don't 12 know. Hours I, I long, 12 hours is a 12 hours is a long campaign. <laughs> I really don't know what the average length of a game is in 2020. I'll just be completely 10 to 12 honest. hours is a, 20, <laughs> 10 to 12 hours is a, is a standard like single player campaign and a game that has single player and multiplayer. Like okay. that's. That's one of the reasons God of War was surprising because it was like twenty hours long. And, like everyone was kind of expecting it to be about half that. Um, like it's, en it's like it's enough. Like part because part of the thing here is like you know I am enjoying the campaign, but I also kind of want to just be able to focus on Iron Man because that's my favorite character to play as. Right. Um, so like it's a it's about as long as it needs to be. I okay. Would say. Well, you you do bring up a good point though, and that is once the game does kind of break open and you're digging into the war table and you're out kind of in the connected world. Um, you know, it will afford you the opportunity to explore a character that you really want to explore versus the mm -hmm. campaign where it's like, yeah, you're controlling Iron Man in this mission and now here's Black Widow. Um, mm -hmm. So you're right. I mean, there there's definitely some upside to kind of the open world cooperative stuff that I haven't really got a chance to explore because it was broken in the beta. Um, and it sounds like it's still mm -hmm. for how is that still broken, Matt? Well, I guess because it's not, the day one patch isn't up yet. Really, <laughs> they went through the beta for three weeks and yeah, it's but, still but, not working. I don't I don't find that particularly concerning. I mean, I it, do. if it doesn't work on Friday then or Thursday night, then we'll talk because like this is just this is early access stuff. It's still it early is, access. but I mean it's um, still people the bigger, the the bigger game. it's not that big of a deal to me. I don't think until unless it really still doesn't work at the, you know, on launch day. Uh, the bigger concern is that there are mul multiple game breaking save breaking bugs in this. No. Um, I haven't run into them, but I've seen them uh, online like there's and they were in the beta as well. Basically think the, the, the way it happens and it happens a lot the most common place is at the the harm room you know the the danger room basically mm -hmm. you know the, the little training place yeah um at the end of those missions sometimes you can fall through the floor oh and like in that of, virtual room yeah. that you're in and instead of this happens other places too but this is apparently it's mostly the videos i've seen have all been at the end of harm uh, training missions um you can fall through the floor and the game can checkpoint there Oh, the accident. God. And so every time you load your save, you're just falling through a void. Oh, there's my God. No way, there is no way to um, get out of the it. loop. Yeah. There's, there's no load option to, to like pick other auto saves. So you're basically stuck there. The only way to do it <laughs> is to basically, if you, the only way to fix that is to delete the save and the profile and start over. And the merc marketplace purchases or things like that are saved, but your character progress is gone. Well, it sounds um, like Crystal, Dyna Crystal Dynamics has bigger fish to fry. I mean, yeah. if there's still like game breaking save bugs, then so that is a thing. I have not run into it. I do not. Also, the part of the problem, I guess, is if you have it set to automatically back your saves up on the cloud, mm -hmm. that will screw you. If that oh, because to SA you. is just being uploaded because they just upload that save, yeah. and now both your saves are that. So I, I do have because I don't want to use up all my save space on my PlayStation Plus. Cloud save, so I have yeah. all that stuff manual. Okay. So I do have it, man my save manually backed up. Uh, so if that happens, I can go in and pull it down, and I'm okay. Um, but that is, a, you know, so that is a thing to be aware of. That's another thing. Like if that happens to you on Xbox, if you're playing on Xbox. Um, basically, turn the system off, like because because Xbox backs to the cloud when you quit a game out. Oh, so Just turn the, the system button. off. Reopen the open. The, you know, start the system up again. Delete your saves locally and pull down the cloud save from the last time you played. And like maybe you'll lose a lot of progress uh, because you've been playing for a while since the last time you started the game up. But you won't lose your whole campaign. Okay. Uh, alternately, don't buy this until they fix that. Would yeah. Be kind of my my suggestion. I they know about. I know they know about it because they've been in the Reddit saying like oh. thanks for letting us know. So they know that's a thing in there. Um, well, that's my next question. And you know this this was coming. Should people buy it? So I sent out a tweet, I think it was yesterday or the day before, 
asking if people were going to buy it. And of the people that replied, there were like two that said that they were. Yeah. Well, see, here's the thing. I really do like it. The other, but it is technically rough in the sense of those those bugs. There are a lot of weird, I would call them traversal glitches, where like characters get stuck on little ledges and like bounce up and down a bunch, or like they don't. You know, there's an automatic swing section where like they don't swing properly and you just sort of fall to your death and like it doesn't and there's like weird things where like the load times are very long if you do die or fall off something you can be sitting there for a minute waiting for it to reload in fact the weirdest one so there's a section where you have to jump jump along the side of the helicarrier over like swinging bars you know and the first time i the there's like three bars and then you land on a platform and the first bar i did the swing and for whatever reason it just didn't swing properly and she sort of went off to the side and fell into nothing and then she instantly reset to the platform you started from right mm. and so i did it again and then the, it worked this time and i landed on the platform but i slid off the platform and fell again so this is like three <laughs> two more jumps <laughs> since there right uh -huh. and it loaded for a minute and a half to put me oh back on that platform gosh. where the when i fell off the first jump it was an instant reset Right. So what happened there? Somehow you fell to some place that tripped a new checkpoint. Right. What I think is I crossed a flag that was trying to you yep. know, streaming load the next room, and it just didn't expect me to defend. So, but like that kind of stuff, you know, the load times are long. There's that's the, the problem with the flow in the campaign is actually that you spend a lot of time sitting there staring at everybody sitting in the in the Quinjet, like yeah. waiting for the load times to go through. And they do talk, and there's banter during that scene, those scenes. So that's you know, it keeps you engaged, but it could it should be better, I think. Okay. Um, obviously, you still haven't answered the question. Should people um, buy it? <laughs> I think you should buy it if you like Avengers. I think you should buy it if uh, you like like if you like God of War style combat because the, the depth is there. But I do think that if you want to hold off and wait and see a how they handle DLC characters uh, when when it actually happens with Kate Bishop in October, which was going to be Black Panther, by the way, uh, uh, they, they changed that because of Chadwick Boseman's death. They didn't yeah. feel right to have black panther suddenly it's like a celebration of black panther or whatever and you're like or you swap it and make him the first one he was going to be the first one oh that, was, that, that seemed was, like it would make sense the timing would have worked out i think no I th I, they didn't want to do that this week with that oh. happening. and they definitely what the other thing they could have done is that would have also helped with some of the bad press they're getting right now is okay the first character is black panther and this battle passes free yeah i they didn't want to touch it and yeah. I don't blame him. I can understand like, it, that it, reason. Because it feels like, it would feel like capitalizing Trying on to the cash debt. in. Yeah. It is. Um, it's a so. perspective thing, but you're right. Some people would be like, oh, you're trying to cash in. It's not worth it. But Black Panthers, you know, they, they, there was some more data mining was done. They found more characters. There's a huge roster coming. You got Ant-Man. You got the Wasp. You got all these things. So I'm just they, hoping they, that the I, content to to consume with those characters is worthwhile. That's my big concern with this well, game apparently, in general. So I'm seeing in the chat that there is there are cutscenes in the solo quest lines. Okay. Uh, That's so good there's to hear. something there. Wow. Um if and certainly like there's there's a there's some shortcomings in like there's only six bosses in the game. Mm. Um which seems to be they're sort of giving each character their own boss. You know, like so, like Hulk gets that abomination, sense, and that kind of thing. Yeah. You'd like to see um, more, but you'd like to see more. But I mean, if they add a boss with every character they oh, add, that, like, would, that would be, be that would be know, cool. Yeah. If you fight like the character specific boss at the end of their solo quest line, and then that gets added to kind of the rotation, because because one of the faction things you can do is go fight a high level version of a boss. No, oh. in a, in another mission, and like that gets you rewards for that. Like that that resets every couple of days. I can't do that yet because those those battles are like level. 50 or 60. So I'm like 30 levels below where I need to be to do that. Yep. But, um, but that's all there too. Um, so I think that's sort of, uh, I, I think it's entirely fair to sit back and wait and see how they handle this after six months. Um, I'm not sorry. I that's a long time to sit and wait. Cause think about all the stuff that's going to happen in the next six. Well, months. that's kind of what I'm saying. Though, consoles is, coming out. And well, that's kind of <laughs> what I'm saying though, is like, there's plenty to do yeah. in the meantime. And if in like next spring, Avengers is like in really good shape, go for it. You know, so See, you're saying I, don't I, buy it, Matt. That's what you're I saying. I think unless you're like a super fan, like I am, or like you're very forgiving of sort of early access bug bugginess at this point, I would say um, most people are going to be a little irritated that they spent sixty bucks on it. I really like it, but okay. I'm not going to pretend that part of that isn't just because I wanted to play a decent Avengers game for like 10 years. <laughs> yeah, you know, I like. Like this is really you know moment to moment like you know combat based like and character driven like the, this is a really good game but 
is it polished to the point that we we should expect from something like you know that demands a full sixty dollars and a game as a service idea and like wants microtransactions out of you? You know, ideally that's what they're after. Um, probably not. Like it's it's not unlike Destiny One at launch in that regard, where you're like, okay, there's something here, but you're not quite. It hasn't quite gelled yet. You know what I mean? I think that comparison will provide a lot of value for our viewers and listeners mm-hmm. because everybody can go back to the first yeah. Destiny and again. It's it's not remember how they felt. Like it's not Anthem. Like by any means, yeah. is this not is this another Anthem? But it is sort of one of those things like with Destiny, where like I really like playing this. But like, you remember how you played Destiny One, and like you really like kind of playing moment to moment and popping heads. Yeah, the heads combat like felt great. Yeah. Honest, and like that kind of thing. And then you like you'd hit the load screen, and you'd be like, "Why am I yeah. doing this? Yeah, yeah. Like, wait yeah. a minute. Like, what? Wait, I'm a just minute. gonna like, go." Wait. So fill up another robot with lead. Yeah. yeah. And like this, this isn't that bad because the campaign does keep you playing. But I do think you have a very strong point when you say, okay, once that campaign's over, why am I coming back to this every day? Okay. And you'd be coming back to it because punching stuff feels great in this game. But there will be that destiny moment between punchings where you're like, wait, it what gives am I, you that what moment of reflection. Like, they like, should what am I working that. towards here? You, know, you have <laughs> yeah. that moment of clarity where you're like, well, wait, uh-huh. what's the point? I'm getting more powerful so I can do what variants <laughs> of the same mission with bigger so numbers. I can become like more that. powerful. Yeah. I mean, so like, and I will probably keep loop. doing that for a while because I love playing as Iron Man and Thor and all that stuff. And like, yeah. I want to see all these other characters coming in. They got a Scarlet Witch in the, in the data mining. They found Scarlet Witch. And I'm like, what the hell is she going to play? Like, <laughs> awesome. I'm in for that. Hey, but did like, the beta progress carry over? Did it work? It no. didn't. Because they said that it was supposed to, but I guess not. No, they didn't. I they thought I were, read the, no. that they had said that it was there, your progress you carryover. If you finished all the helicarrier training missions, uh, you got some bonus item stuff. Oh, that's when, it. Huh? When you load it, but no, that, that was ne- that was never going to carry over. Oh, yeah. I thought it was. Okay, um, so there you go. That's Marvel's Avengers from Matt's perspective. I will start playing it as soon as the show is over today. I am really excited to play it. I really enjoyed the beta, at least the campaign part of it. Um, so we will probably talk about it again next week, but only if I found some things about the game that either we didn't bring up this week or things that I disagree with Matt on or things that I have a different perspective on. So probably we'll be in, in next week's episode, but I'm not going to 100% it. Uh, but I am excited to play it, and I'm glad that Matt has enjoyed it uh, because as you guys all know, he is a huge Marvel and uh, X-Men, Avengers, whatever fan. So uh, Recent Avengers fan. I, I will emphasize I didn't care about the Avengers until about 2012. Yeah. I, I just know that when stuff like this comes around, I rely on your your opinion, Matt, in mm-hmm. general. And so well, as, as a me, comics fan, it's a it's legit. Like whoever the, the writers, the you know, the guy who wrote and directed this, like they know their stuff in terms of the characters and, and the and the and the lore. Um yeah. to me, but, your opinion on this kind of stuff holds a lot of weight. So um I'm just gonna jump in next week if I find some things here or there that maybe we didn't get to this week, or if maybe there's a couple things that we disagree on a little bit. But otherwise, I think Matt's opinion is pretty damn trustworthy. So there you go. That's Marvel's Avengers out Friday for everyone. Um I was surprised at the response I got to my tweet, how many people were not gonna buy it. Um so we'll see how it goes. I think wait and, I think wait and see is entirely reasonable. Yeah, I, I totally get that. Uh, I just it's been a while. You know, everyone finished The Last of Us Part Two. Mm -hmm. quite a while ago and it's kind of the next big blockbuster i just thought more people would be like i need something to play so i guess not we'll see i mean i've had a lot of casual friends like hit me up about this game like the the interest is there from the non-hardcore realm i guess and look i've been following like reddit and reset era and twitter i'm like most of the impressions from people who have started playing this thing are pretty positive Yep. Um, they're acknowledging the bugs. They acknowledge that it's rough. They acknowledge that maybe the games as a service thing will kind of like take over and be a problem later. But what? But they made a good fighting game here. They made a good beat 'em up with this thing, and everybody kind of feels their like their own character. The biggest question for me, I think, it would be very easy to make Spider Man a reskin of Black Widow. I think um, you mentioned that in a prior episode. Yeah, actually. but even more so now that I played her more in this, like. You could just replace the, the the grappling hook with webs and her guns with web shooter balls and be done with it. Well, that's but probably like, what they're doing. <laughs> I hope there's a little more ambition to it than that. Because yeah. if it's not, if it's if it's that, if it's that, like I will be a little judgmental about that. I think I don't think they can get away with that, Matt. I don't like, think they Spidey, can. Either. The Spidey stands are way too hardcore for that. You got you got to bring, especially because you you know you're doing it on play, exclusive on PlayStation. And PlayStation, by that point, is going to have two phenomenal Spider-Man games. Yeah, and you're you're, right. you better deliver that character on this thing, or what's the what is even the point? I will say though, 
I think the cutscenes in this game are Spider-Man quality. That's I think I think some of, some of the performances and, and scenes in this game are as good as stuff in Spider-Man. That's great to hear. Okay, before we move on, I do want to thank people who subscribed via Twitch Prime at the early part of the show. Again, this is a huge deal for us. Um, if you're listening to the show on any of the dozens of podcast services it's been distributed out to, and you don't have any money to help us at patreon.com slash sifted, Twitch Prime is a great way to do it. So I wanted to thank these people. Um, let's see. Minority Games, thank you. Jeff Lynn 99 thank you. Tiny2K, thank you. Uh, T- Im- Impler, I think. My handwriting's terrible. Danboy90, um, and The McWomble. Thanks, you guys, all for Twitch Prime as the show kicked off. Uh, next up, we're going to talk about what was one of the most commented stories on Sifted this week. Um, and I was a little surprised because my only comment on the story was, is anyone surprised? Uh, and that is that it was basically announced by Ubisoft this week that the PlayStation 5 is basically going to ignore backwards compatibility for any PlayStation other than the PlayStation 4. Now, since then, Ubisoft has removed the verbiage from its website that stated that. I'm sure once people started freaking out, uh, Sony contacted Ubisoft and asked Ubisoft to remove it. Um but the cat's out of the bag. So we know now that all those empty, a lot of people, and even myself said, oh, who would, wouldn't expect this? But if you really think about it, when they showed off the PlayStation 5 for the first time, when Cerny gave his presentation, and they talked about backwards compatibility, they had like a graphic up that said like PS5, PS4, and then had a bunch of empty slots underneath it. And I think it's fair to say that a lot of people would have, would assume those slots are being left there for PS3, PS2, and PS1. Well, as it turns out, that is that is not the case. Um, you're only going to be able to play PlayStation 4 games on your PS5. Um, at least initially, we don't know if maybe long-term, Sony has a different plan, but it looks like out of the gate, that's all we're going to get. So, Matt, as I said, I wasn't surprised by this at all. I never really thought PlayStation was going to make another PS3 that goes all the way back. Um, are you surprised by it at all? No, I mean, I certainly. I mean, I think they will get there with mo- except PS. I will be very surprised if they ever do an actual PS3 emulator on anything. Um, maybe like so hard. The, maybe the next system. I don't. It just, it just requires so much raw power. Yeah. To, to do that, um, I wouldn't. But it wouldn't surprise me if we got like PS1 and PS2 backwards compatibility later on. I mean, they made they made PS One work with like Bleem. Like, yeah, I mean, like, it's, if you it's, can make it's, it work with like a boot disc, like they should be able to make PS One. Yeah, work it's just on I can't imagine it's a priority for launch for them. Right, you know, like yeah. no one's gonna I mean, nothing's gonna live or die. It should be a priority. Period. You know, on I in my opinion, like I, I think really, it should be. I think I think preserving this stuff and keeping it moving forward, especially if you're going to be more and more digital. Also, like. If you do get that working, you can sell every PS1 and PS2 game ever made outside of licensing issues digitally through your damn PSN store and make tons of free money, basically. Yeah. Like, if you can get a, a quick plug-and-play solution like what Xbox has figured out, like, you can make a lot of extra money off that from nostalgia. Like, I hear I, you about the archiving part of it, losing a part of gaming history yeah. as everything goes digital. I totally get that. But, like, is it something that you need for launch? No. Not at all. I mean, PS4 stuff, yes, because you want people to be able to carry their library for because so much stuff has been digital this generation. And you're not going to have the most robust, let's be honest, the most robust launch lineup, no matter which console you are here. So you want people to be able to play their older things that they like, that you, they can like load up and have it, you know, no load time and it looks a little better. And da, 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 da. Yeah. Um, Great. You know, like, like Cerny said, the 100 most popular games on PS4 will work and have bells and whistles, you know, on PS5. I mean, that's great. It's good um, enough. It's totally yeah. good enough. For the it's average person enough. looking to buy a console, that's all they want. Yeah, like, and no one's going to not buy your system because you're like, well, I was really hoping to play Bust the Move 2 right. on this. I they agree. say, no, that's, that's not happening. I agree. Um, so, yeah, it's not too shocking. Um, like, I don't know who was really raring to play Vagrant Story on this thing, but I'm sorry. <laughs> they can list a bunch of happen. games. Yeah. It's just like, no, um, no one cares. <laughs> it's more important that they have the PS4, you know, prominent line. You know, can you think of more than 100 prominent PS4 games you'd want to play? No. I can't. Like, no. All their exclusives. My, my and maybe library a for PS4 is not 100 games. It's no. not my physical like, library. So, like all their exclusives, like and like maybe you know 50 exclusives and maybe 50 major third-party games and indie games that like define some things, and that would be what yeah, you have on good. PS5 at launch. Great, great. Yep. Like that's no totally problem. Fine. 
Yeah. Um, so I think it's fine. I, I don't, I don't, I mean, it's, it's again, the, the, the most striking thing about this to me is just how often Yubi blows stuff. I think <laughs> it's just like, so terrible. <laughs> it's so weird. Like it really is. I don't know what their deal is, man. They just don't care. I guess they think they're big I enough. Guess, that, or it's just a big, such a big company. It's hard to tell what all the hands are doing. Yeah. You know, like someone in there whose you know, job it is to deal with that website stuff probably doesn't even know what is yeah. and isn't public knowledge yet. And that's just, yeah. you know, something went live the wrong time and that's, so, you know, memo number 33 didn't get read <laughs> by employee number 4,045. Yeah. And that's what happened. Ubisoft's huge and they're spread all over the globe. Totally can see yeah. where one hand isn't speaking to the other. I can see Like it. who knows if the person who like accidentally made that go live even speaks English as a first language and didn't even realize what they're, you know, they might not even have, be able to see the content. It might just be a web design, you know, web, pro, you, know, you don't know. Like you have no idea what tools they're using on these things or who's doing what. So yep. It's just, it's that kind of thing. But like, oh boy, that, would, that must have been an awkward <laughs> phone call. For sure. From Sony. Yep. Uh, Tiny2K, thank you for showering our live viewers with subscriptions again. Uh, again. Another reason why you should show up for the live episode of Game Face. We have amazing sifters in our chat that are just dropping subs on all our viewers. So try to show up live if you can. It's worth it. Also, thanks, Fire Native, uh, for subscribing with Twitch Prime. You guys are awesome. Oh, and I will uh, respond to Delfino109 and say, like, uh, I maintain the cutscenes, not the not the Crystal Dynamics engine, the pre-rendered cutscenes in Avengers are as good as the pre-rendered cutscenes in Spider-Man. Like, okay. a, couple a couple times, they really are that good in terms of performance. Like, it really does get that good. Uh, JM Rain, also gifted subs. JM Rain 99 thank you guys. Awesome, as always. We're well on our way to hitting the hype train again, uh, which is flipping awesome. Uh, so there was another big PlayStation story this week as well, and this one generated even more conversation on Sifted. Um, and this is the fact that during Sony's annual kind of investor state of the company meeting, it announced that it is going to release more PlayStation exclusives for PC. Um, now... I, maybe to just kick off the topic a little bit, I think what I would say is, as long as PlayStation continues to do it the way it's been doing it, I'm totally fine with it. And I think it'll be great for Sony, and I think it'll be great for everybody. And when I say that, what I mean is, release the game exclusively on PlayStation platforms, wait at least two years before you then release it on PC. Now, the statement that PlayStation issued did not say whether they're going to follow kind of the same ideals that they have in the past or if they're going to release them more quickly on PC. I would hope that that were not the case. Um, but if not, and if they stay on the schedule that they've been on, like to me, this is only a positive for pretty much everyone. What do you say, Matt? Yeah, I mean, I hope they use different companies. This because <laughs> For the Hor parts? Yeah, the Horizon Zero Dawn port was not great. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that it, company, Would you say it was good enough, though? No. I no. Wouldn't. Okay. Uh, it was not. It was not finished. Basically, it was. It was a terrible port. I will straight up say that. At the and that is kind of business as usual from that company they use, whose name I can't remember. Begins with a V. Um, but they, they've they've got a history of not great port work. Um, I don't know why you would pick them. As do you your think? Here's a question company. for you, Matt. Do you think PlayStation should maybe either assign one of its current studios or build a studio, a new one? specifically for the purpose of porting its first-party output to PC. I would say if they're serious about it, having an internal studio that does that would probably be warranted. That's already working in the pipelines with the other first-party developers. Yeah. They're already linked in via network and mm -hmm. Slack and anything else that you use for workflow. Yeah. I mean, headhunt like good people from Bluepoint and like the really be good port houses to form that, comp that, that internal group, but like... Do it right or don't bother doing it, I say. And like kind of contracting it out is fine, but like the contracting it out part, like as we've already seen, sometimes these ports can be amazing and sometimes they can be a disaster. And it would be nice to have some consistency there. In the same way that there's consistency with Sony's first party output on their own systems. You know, yep. now, you should Matt, be able to buy a Sony a Sony exclusive ported to PC and be sure of what you're getting in terms of quality. Agreed. Like they, and I think like it's very important for Sony as well to make sure that that is the case. Yes. Um, because at the end of the day, it's their name on that game. It's mm -hmm. not Bluepoint or whatever. It's PlayStation. And, it's and I think Gorilla learned that firsthand because people were blaming them for the PC port problems and not yep. the company. I can't even remember the name of the company that did the PC port. But like 
um, it was, uh, you know, that, that, that's going to reflect on your people. So I think, I think it would make, if that, if they really are serious that this is like a new, you know, branch of their business, they should do it themselves. I'd agree with that. That's true. Yep. Um, now Matt, as far as I threw the two years out there, what to you is the least amount of time that Sony could wait to port a game to PC without angering fans and those who plunked down a lot of money to buy that PlayStation five. I say you wait a year. So you'd be okay with a year. I think that's the delay. shortest. Yeah. Yeah. That I think that's cutting it a little too close for me. Um, that, is, that is the closest I would get. I would say okay. a, little, a little longer is probably better, but if you, if you want to cut it down to the absolute minimum, uh, a year, assuming all the DLC and all the game of the year version and stuff is out by then. Like if you wanted to put the PC port out at the same time you put out the game of the year version for PS5, I think that's reasonable. Sifters, what say you? Just type in the number of months into the chat. Um, yeah, I want to start seeing what everyone else thinks. Uh, Film Gamer says 18 months. Um, I mean, that's a good period of time too. Michelle Burns says zero. <laughs> Because he, I'm guessing he's a big PC gamer and just wants to see all those games. Yeah, I mean, on you're, PC you're never, you're never awesome. getting that. But like, yeah, I think, it, I think a year is fair. Yeah, it, I mean, most people are saying 12 months. Um, Mitch says two years. Bobby Budnick says 12 to 18 months. And you can see who the PC gamers are. <laughs> They're all putting mm-hmm. zero or one. Uh, but the vast majority, well, I don't know. It actually, I think if I averaged out. All of them, it probably would come to 18 months. That's what it looks like. Mm-hmm. Just looking at the numbers and doing this subliminal math. I mean, I, <laughs> I would, would think eight, I would think 18 months is the more realistic yeah. idea. Like if you're, but if you're asking me, like, what would I? What was the absolute lower limit of me not being annoyed? That, well, it would like, keep you from getting pissed off, basically. Yeah, that would be a year. Okay. Um, and so but I think 18 months is probably more more likely. I mean, the other thing is to remember too is if you think about financially for PlayStation, is it better to get it out to PC quicker so that you sell more copies of the PC version? Or is it better to hold that exclusivity on the console longer so that you sell more games on the console? I'm sure they have an algorithm somewhere that tells them exactly what to do and when to mm-hmm. do it. It's just one of those things My I start thinking about it and like my smoke starts coming right. out of my ears. Well, I, the other thing is I think you want, if you're Sony, you want this the teams focusing on the PlayStation version. And if you have yeah. a PC version launching simultaneously, at the very least, you have a second team working on that that then has to be fed, fed info and fed code and fed assets by the main team. And then the main team, by in turn, is taking time out of making the game to devote at least some resources to making sure that PC team is informed and fed uh you know, assets. So if you're Sony and you're trying to use these games to push your own platform, you want that game done, finished, focus on the PlayStation version. When it's done and over and finished, then you can hand it to the PC port and worry about that then because it's not in their interest to do anything simultaneous because that's a drain on resources that doesn't benefit them. Because let's face it, PC sales are not going to match the sales on PlayStation. Like if you have your if happen. you have your own studio and you're developing the PC version alongside, um that probably helps. Um but mm-hmm. chances of Sony building a brand new studio just for this is pretty slim. Pretty right slim. Now. And even if they did, I don't think they would have them taking time away from the main teams building these games. I think you want these games done and finished and, start. and you just hand that over to the port people and be like, go for it. And if you have any questions, let us know. And that way you haven't you haven't split the difference at all on trying to make a PC version while you're making a PlayStation version because they are always going to prioritize the PlayStation version. I don't think that would be true if you're talking about like Microsoft. Microsoft clearly yeah. does everything at once. Um, but Sony is always going to see their own hardware as the priority in the same way that you're probably not going to see a simultaneous PC release of a Nintendo game anytime yeah. soon. Like yeah. they want to sell their own hardware and that's just the reality of the situation. Yeah, because I mean, it's again, it's the razors and the razor blades. You want to sell the hardware so that you can sell the more razor blades, which mm-hmm. are the games. Um, Matt, one last question for you. When you're selling 10 million copies of a $60 <laughs> razor blade, that works out pretty well. <laughs> it, in the it, end. it definitely does. Um, I have one last question for you, Matt. Uh, are there any sacred cows, meaning, are there any franchises, PlayStation exclusive franchises, that you would say never port to PC. That needs to always stay on PlayStation platforms. No. 
because it's been curious the games that they've chosen. I think a lot of it so far has just been like, which ones are going to be the easiest to port to PC based upon how they were developed by the team that developed the original game. But that's, I feel like that's going to change here soon. And it's, they're just going to be, they're just going to start picking them intelligently instead of what's going to be able to be released the soonest. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't think anything should stay on anything like the, you know, the, the so God of War, Spider Man should sure. go to PC. I mean, Spider Man is a complicated situation because of the licensing. Right. So Marvel probably has a say in that. Yeah. But no, I don't think anything should stay on PlayStation. Like, there's no reason for that. Like, Do you think more time for certain franchises maybe than others? I think that's up to whoever's making them mm-hmm. or whoever, whatever Sony thinks they should do with it. Like, I can't imagine there's going to be a lot of PC players that like would forego the PlayStation version. And so, I mean, I just don't think there's that much overlap. Like I'm, you know, especially if it comes out even six months earlier, I'm going to buy the PlayStation version of a thing I really want to play. I'm not going to wait six months for a PC version of that. Like, I, th- I think you've still got the audience in place. Um, I, I just, I, you know, I think that it's true that, you know, we got the, what was it, Flower and Journey. Is there a PC version of Flower or is it just Journey? I think there is. Okay. They, make, they make both of those. Yeah, yeah. That, was, that was easy. I mean, those are just, you know, pretty simple ports. Yeah. Uh, Death Stranding got a PC version for God knows why. Probably just something Kojima wanted to do. Horizon got a port. Well, I know why. They needed to make more of their money back. Something. But I mean, obviously <laughs> that obviously that port was in the works before. Yeah. Um, simultaneously and, and before, uh they knew that the game did not set the world on fire. Um, and then Horizon, I think, happened because you already had the engine ported. Same to engine. PC, yeah. So they, why, why not? Yep. Um, and the answer is because you picked a shitty port studio to do it. <laughs> but, um, but it could have been great. It would, you know, would have been, I mean, I think there are things that you're going to have to, to, if you want to do this, you have to alter moving forward. Like Horizon had the problem where um, the character animations were 30 frames a second and there was no real way to speed those up. Um, or that things were tied to the frame rate where like, if you sped up the game to 60 frames a second, I think you, you also altered how fast the physics happened. You know, it was (laughs) things like that because (laughs) you never, because if you never anticipate having to put this thing on any other systems, you aren't going to build in any kind of, you know, you're never going to factor that in. If you need to, if you can make it work by doing that, do it because you're never going to have to worry about doing that, but you are never going to worry about making it run anything else. But like, they did in the end, so you had problems with that. Um, but it's just, it's you know, going forward, you you might have to have your teams be a little more aware of that if you think this is a priority, or you could just put up subpar ports and say screw it. Like who knows what they're going to do? You know, it's Sony; they run hot and cold on this kind of thing. So yeah. Final question: Now that Microsoft and Sony are both releasing ex- exclusives for PC, do you think Nintendo will do it? No. I don't Ninten- either. Nintendo will never do that. <laughs> Nintendo either. does not care about you yeah. or me or PCs or anything. It's way too protective of everything to no. do something like that. Yeah, I don't see I mean, I'd love either. it. I'd love to play Nintendo stuff on a decent hardware rig, but like I would absolutely do that. But uh, no, I never think that'll happen. Sometimes Nintendo does come along with the crowd. I just don't think this is a case no, where that's I, just, I don't see that happening. And this. I would prefer Nintendo just get Nintendo online up to scratch with the other online services before they worry about making PC versions of their games. Just yeah, my take. Definitely, definitely one thing at a time, I guess. Yeah, yeah, for but, sure. Uh, um, so, but I think we both agree that this is going to, we we probably both agree that they are going to wait 18 months at least. Um, and yeah. they are probably going to do a better job on their PC ports going forward after the backlash that they got from Horizon. Um, so I hope I think, so. Yeah. So I think just ultimately, this is just going to be great for everyone. Uh, people who buy a PlayStation are not going to be salty that 18 months later an exclusive comes out. People on PC, I believe, are going to totally understand that they have to wait 18 months to play them. Everyone's going to be able to play them now, and everyone's going to buy them now, and Sony's going to make more money, and more players are going to be happy. So that is a win, win, win. I am curious if get uh, in this industry. <laughs> I am curious if like we're going to get just ports of like kind of PS5 stuff going forward, or if they will dip into the back catalog and like put, Bloodborne or something like that. Maybe like Bloodborne, Bloodborne would be obviously, huge on PC. obviously that's the thing everybody wants is Bloodborne on PC. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility, but like, I also don't think it's happening right now. Um, I do think we will get a PlayStation five enhanced version, like not a version, but you know, I think it's one of those top 100 PS4 games that Cerny's talking about. Yeah. That will have yeah. Bells and whistles on For it. Sure. Yeah. Um, I don't know, like, but like, you know, it'd be crazy you, if it wasn't, do you, do you dip back into the catalog and put the, you know, the uncharted collection 
on, on know. you know that seems like kind of free I mean, you money got Uncharted you 4 as well I mean that game is still stunning like still yeah. boot up Uncharted 4 that game still looks amazing so I mean there's just we've been showing the b-roll I mean there's days gone there's so many games that I think would work very well on PC and would sell very well on PC so it's just a whole new market open up for Sony and I'm totally cool with it because if they make more money that's more money they can invest in first party content for PlayStation so it's all good, whether you're a PC gamer or I, a PlayStation gamer. And I assume you don't think there's anything that should stay on... No, on, no. Yeah. Uh, the, oddly enough, I will say the one franchise I thought about whenever I was kind of getting that question together to ask you was Gran Turismo of all of them. I don't know hmm. why. That was the first game that popped to my mind when I was like, "Is it should any franchise not go to PC? And I don't know why that was it. Like The, the only thing I could th say about not putting GT on anything would be like, what's the point? Like, because they're great driving sims and it is a, yeah there's so many other great driving options Better, on I pc yeah i would yeah i would agree with that yeah. like it all it feels like kind of a waste of time it'd be like, nice to be play a, gt with some of the peripherals that pc yeah has, though. like it, the driving yeah. wheels and stuff on pc are amazing like i kind of see that not because i'm just like oh gt's a sony thing it should stay on sony but because like mm, that's probably a waste of time yeah, yeah, for was, whatever reason, that's the game that just went poink right into my head. True. Whenever I, thought. I, I guess I could kind of see an argument for dreams. Yeah, um, just, just because I don't. <laughs> what a nightmare it would probably be to port that yeah, game. Yeah, is my yeah. guess. Um, I just don't. And think. it feels like you can, if you want to do something like that on PC, just get Unity. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Just get like, just get Unreal Engine. You can get yeah. it for free now. So why would you just half step and go with something like that? I totally understand that. So. There you go. Those are the latest updates on PlayStation and PlayStation 5. Like I say every week, any news about PS5 or Xbox Series X, we're going to talk about it here on Game Face. Next up, we're going to talk about a game that is not a PlayStation 5 or Xbox Series X game. Uh, that game is WRC9. You may be wondering, why are we talking about this game on Game Face? We usually stick to the really big stuff, but I would argue that this is kind of big stuff, for, especially for this week in particular. WRC8's Metacritic average is 8.0. And I remember last year when it came out and I started reading some of the reviews, I was like, wow, okay, I need to give this game a chance next year. And so I did. Um, and so I've, I've got the review code a few days ago. I've been playing it for quite a while now. And my overarching opinion of WRC9 is if this game is any indication, real rally racing drivers are insane. Because this game is a very rigid rally racing sim. In fact, the first, the first race that you participate in, they measure you to see how good you are. And then they will turn on driving assist to help you based upon how well you do in that first race. And I did terrible in that first race. <laughs> and, and they gave me like no driving assist at all. Like maybe they're there. It didn't feel like it. The first 45 minutes of playing this game... I could, and you're seeing actually the first like race I ever did. I could hardly keep the car on the road. Um, the other thing about it is it's incredibly realistic. There are 13 different real rally courses in this game. And inside each one of those courses are like eight or nine different tracks or variants. And then they'll mirror them and they'll flip them. Um, so there are tons and tons of tracks and it's all authentic. The real cars, the real tracks, the real courses, real everything. But these courses are insane. Matt, have you ever watched rally racing on TV? Like real rally, yeah. rally racing, yes. I mean, yeah. they are crazy. They, oh, they yeah. are nuts. Not only are they nuts, the fans watch, stand you, along the side of the track. You remember You remember Andrew? The, yeah, the, yeah. For the, he's a big, big rally, rally racing fan. So I watched a fair amount of stuff with him. Uh, it's amazing like the, Dude, they're crazy the preparation on it they're like the fact that they've got the map of everything and they got a guy sitting there just telling you like you know what what the turn coming up is and you have to know what that is like it's and Dude, like they're power actually, sliding 100 miles an hour around a curve on a dirt road yep. with and actually one of the things that i'm most impressed by are the spectators who just stand there that's on what the i was turn saying they're insane like, <laughs> they're like it's a death wish and so anyway uh, watching real rally racing, I went back and started looking at some stuff on YouTube after playing this game, and they are bonkers. And this game makes you feel bonkers because the tracks are really narrow. Uh, there's tons of just drop-offs on the edge where if you slide off the road, you fall down like 300 yards down into a valley. It, it The roads themselves, they're not streets. So they have like 
rocks and trees sticking out kind of on the edge of the of the road. And if like one tire hits one of those rocks, like you spin out. Oh, yeah. Rally racing is the absolute bleeding edge of driving skill. It's nuts. Like it is it is one of the most impressive things in all of motorsports to me. And that's this game represent and I I see now why last year's game got the scores that it did because it is a very rigid, very realistic rally racing sim. But it's like the thing that I said many many times. A game that's realistic doesn't mean that it's necessarily fun. True. And and this game is one of those racing games where you always have to go slower than you think you have to go. Uh, your first few times around a track, you're going to crash almost every turn because you think that you have plenty of time to break and you just don't. Part of it is there's ice on the road or it's gravel or dirt or whatever, so you're skidding a little bit. But even in the tarmac, like you really have to anticipate turns in this game and take them really slowly. And when you first start doing it, you're like, oh, you're going to be like, oh, my gosh, I'll have no chance of winning this. I'll have, I'll have no chance of making it to the rally weekend, placing in, you know, in the time trials well enough. And then you get to the finish line and you do like because you just you think you have to go way faster than you really do, I guess is the best way I would put it. So you end up being really reckless when you first start playing it. And then you start to understand like the feathering that you have to do in this game with the accelerator is crazy. Um, you'd get into the groove after a while. I have not used the DualShock 4 like this in a driving game, maybe ever, as far as just never, ever fully depressing it. It's just always degrees of going up or going down with your finger. Um, and you eventually, you get into the groove and you start to understand this game and you start to have a little bit more fun with it. Um, the problem is that this game is just very sterile it has no frills there are no cinematics like there's a career mode and everything where you start out and like you pick from one of three cars and then you you know you start recruiting a team and there are skill trees for your garage with four different disciplines um there's like your your team there's your car's reliability there's like enthusiasm there's these so there's these trees that you're building up as you play through the career mode, but there's nothing to ever give it any sort of context other than oh my car is wrecked and I need to get it fixed before the next race. Um, so it's just a very paint by the numbers game, but there are a lot of numbers. There's a lot of modes too. In addition to the career that I brought up, there's a season mode. There are challenges. There's a quick play, so you can just choose any track or event you want and just race right away. It is just loaded to the gills with content, but it's all very samey. It's all, how good are you at, as a real rally race driver? Uh, can you handle these tracks, going really fast down these tracks? It is very, very frustrating, and you have to have a lot of patience to play these games, or to play this game. Um, but again, I am understanding now that I've played it, why it is huge. The other problem is that it's hard all on its own. Look at the track that's on the B-roll right now, Matt. Mm -hmm. That is the second race that you <laughs> race in the game. So it's pitch black. You have headlights, which I will say work really realistically in this game. They look great. And then the whole track is flooded. And they're like, here you go. I think the track is even called like impossible track. It's the second one that they give you. It's almost like they're, they're teasing players or they're trying to test you to make you quit their game at times. It's like... Well, if you can get through this, you'll like the rest of the... That's not how you should design a game. There's no curve to this. It's like you just start it and like the first race starts and they're measuring you to see how good you are and you come to your first turn and you're probably just going to fly off the road and roll. Um, so it well, is I mean, it's the ninth game. You should know how to play this by now, right? I guess if you keep buying it, but I mean, it's still one of those games. It doesn't sell. Well, the, fir the well. first tip I'd give you is switch to cockpit mode. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. Like, I never race in cockpit mode. I used to in real, realistic, mode realistic, it was way easier. Realistic racing, you got to do first person. Like, I can't play third person racing. Like, it's just outside of like really arcade stuff, like Need for Speed. Um, I will always use at the very least like a hood mode. Um, like, plop the camera like right where the windshield meets the hood. Like, that's about where my mind is when I drive a car, right? Like, right. I'm not seeing, you know, I don't see the back of the car. I don't see. You know, I see a little bit of the hood and the world, and, like, that's it. Uh, also, if you're going to play – if you're really going to play this game, you need a steering wheel. Like, I would not attempt to play a game like this without a wheel. Uh, I do not own a wheel for PC, so I would not <laughs> attempt to play this game is basically what I'm saying. Well, I played this um, on PS4, but 
but that is that is what this is this stuff is for is for wheel. I do I think I do have a wheel for PS4. PS4. I have a PC wheel, but not one for. I have that that Porsche one, uh, the Fanatec. I have the crazy expensive Logitech one. I, um, my, the Fanatec one I have is worth a lot of money, but I just don't know, have no anyone who wants it. So it's yeah. been sitting in my garage for two years. But um, I got that from, from G, it's the big one with the frame and everything that like it just, it came from G4 and like no one else wanted it. So here it is. I have a friend in Canada that wants it, but I don't want to pay shipping for that. Um, <laughs> but is that kind of, I mean, this is a sim. This is, you know, like no, a flight it is. simulator. It's very, it's very oh. rigid. Yeah. And like this is not simulator. an arcade racer. And like flight simulator, I'm kind of like, well, I have massive respect for anyone who can play this thing properly, but, uh, Godspeed kind of thing, you know, like yeah. that's sort of where I am with these. I do but not the, have the patience or really the interest in the subject matter to become good at this. And I think but, that's why it's a tough sell. Um, and that's yeah. why it's always going to be niche. And it's also why you don't see this game being fleshed out with cinematics and things like that, because I right. think it knows what its realistic sales target is. But these kind of games need to exist for that audience. You know, it's yeah, good that it exists. I'm glad they're there. I mean, look, if you're a hardcore rally race driver, go buy this immediately. It is, it's, It has everything. All the racers, all the drivers, all the tracks, all the events, all of it. Um, this is the game. If you're a rally racing fan, this is definitely the game to get. Now, I'll talk in a second about another game that's coming soon that I would recommend over this for the more casual folks. But if you're a hardcore rally, this is it. I mean, it there is there are other really realistic sim elements. Like the damage is incredibly realistic in this game, um, and it affects how your vehicles handle and control. And if if you're doing a one-off race, there's a damage limit on your car where if you reach it, you just fail the race and you have to do it all over again. If you're in a rally event, which are like multi-day events where you go and hang for the weekend, you start with time trials and blah, 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 working your way through the main event on the weekend. If you do that, then it's different. But if you if, then you can repair your car in between those races. Although there are some times where on day one, you'll have more than one race. And if you wreck your car in the first race, you have to race your wrecked car in that second race. Um, so again, it is just incredibly realistic. It follows all the tenets of rally racing. And it is exciting and it's fun once you start to get the handle of it. But even once I started getting good at it, it's like you start getting further in, you can't really make mistakes and you make one mistake and you spin out and you just have to start the whole race over again. The other part of this is these laps are literally miles long. So on one, in one perspective, you could say, that gives me some time to make up for my mistakes. But in another sense, if you make a mistake, once you're past like the half or two third point of the track, you just got to start over and all that time you wasted. So these are all things that you got to weigh um, before you decide to jump in on a game like this. Uh, the other thing I would say is the game is 50 bucks. It is not like a 30 or $40 game. And to me, that's way too much. Um, again, it's a low frills game. They got the stuff in there and it works, but they're, they haven't done a lot of extra to it. That's where that extra 20 bucks comes from. Um, and they're trying to get an extra 10 bucks out of something that they shouldn't be getting out of. I would buy this at 30, probably more likely like, no, 30 is fine. I, I, 30 is okay. I probably wouldn't buy it at 40 though. Um, so you know what you're getting into now that you've heard me talk about this game. Um, it's not something you're just going to boot up and be able to just rip through and have a lot of fun with right away. You have to commit to it. Um, I mean, if you don't want to pay full price, you could probably, I mean, there's tons of those, of that series. You could probably just buy an older one. Well, you can probably find WRC eight for like $8 yeah, or something right now. So. And I would say too, that there haven't been a ton of changes for this one. Um, I finally decided to dive in with this one because of how uh, the last game was received, but really there aren't a ton of updates or changes. There are more, there's more online functionality. Like one cool thing you can do in this game is just set up your own car club, um, an online car club, and then people can join it. And then you can just create all the events that you want. The online stuff in this is pretty good. So if you get into the racing hardcore, there's content there to keep you busy. But yeah, uh, eight was free with gold last month. No, oh, uh, and it's go. currently about nineteen ninety nine most places. Or if you want seven, you can get a PC key for that for two dollars and forty three cents. It was really dumb for them to allow them to put out WRC 8 for free right before WRC 9 came out. 
I don't know what they were thinking there. They probably thought that people would get into it and want to buy the new one. But what's really going to happen, having played one of these, is they're going to be like, oh, I'm good. I mean, they do that with uh, a lot of sports games. I mean, I've seen like yeah. MLB The Show does that pretty often. Um, yeah. NBA 2K does that a lot. Like they put That the makes last more sense up. because you're going to get the new rosters and the players that have moved from one team to another and stuff like that. It makes a little more sense for sports than this game, but... I hear what you're saying. I'm sure there's there's uh, detail elements of this sport that escape us that are just as important to people who care. Oh, yeah. I mean, like the radio chatter. It's insane. Yeah. It's like the Micro Machines guy in the car with you. Like, he, I, I can't even follow it. He's just like... I'm like, ah, where's the next turn, bro? Like, just tell me how bad the next turn is. That's all I want. Just tell me, slow the hell down or floor it. Like, that's what I want from my guy. Not him telling me, hard right, left right, my... Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I don't even know what you're talking about, man. Because they use all the, again, all the verbiage from rally racing that I don't know. Um, so again, incredibly realistic, not especially accessible, unfortunately. And I said earlier that there was another game I was going to bring up later on that you should consider, and that game is Dirt 5. Uh, that game is much more user-friendly, much more arcadey, yet typically it does have places where you can kind of set it up so that it is a little bit more simmy. It's way more flexible, I guess is the best way to put it. It's coming out on October 16th, so it's literally like four weeks away. I can guarantee you that it's going to look better than this game. Again, this game really flat. Like, the lighting in it is awful. Um, Dirt is typically one of the best-looking games released every year. In fact, for a long time, Dirt 3 was a game that was being sent out with graphics cards from NVIDIA. Um, mm -hmm. So... I would wait for Dirt 5. <laughs> I'll just be honest. It's going to be full price at 60 bucks, but for an extra 10 bucks, you're going to get way more content. The quality of the game is going to be way higher. There's going to be way more people to play with online, which is another consideration for games like this. So um, I'm, I'll say this. I am impressed with WRC9. It's just not really my cup of tea. And I, I struggle to think that the majority of people who play games would be happy with a $50 purchase of this game. So... There you go. That's WRC9. Next up, we're going to talk about a game that Matt has been playing, something that you guys probably care a little bit more about than WRC9, and that is Wasteland 3, or as I like to call it, the real Fallout. Uh, it's been interesting watching those two franchises kind of duel with each other because one of the uh, one of the DLC releases for Fallout 76 was called like Wastelands. So, you know, they Neither side, yeah. neither side shies away from the fact that Wastelanders is what Fallout really was first. It's the first Fallout, really. Yeah, well, it was the, I mean, Fallout exists because EA wouldn't let the team that made Wasteland make Wasteland 2. Right. So they just went and made another game that was kind of a spiritual successor reinvention of it. That um, became more popular than the game more popular. based on. <laughs> and part of it is because, I mean, look, Wasteland was 1987, 1988, somewhere in there. Um, it was a little more ambitious than it could be for the time. Uh, it was my one, it was my favorite game on the Apple IIe. Uh, I played it, I probably played Wasteland 1 a thousand hours when I was wow. growing up. Like, I guarantee wow. you, I guarantee you I played that game 50, 60 times. Holy start crap. To fin like, it's, it, it's a big RPG, you know, but like, so this is a big I game love that game. Uh, yeah, I mean, I backed this game on Fig. Uh, I backed Wasteland 2. I had forgotten two. that it was like a crowdfunded game at yeah. first until I started looking through the game page on Sifted and got down to the bottom and then like the first thing for it was Wasteland 3 on Fig. Yeah. I was like, holy crap, I, I forgot it. that even if happened. You, if you look like directly behind my, what's usually behind my head, if you see that little thing right here above my finger, yep. that is the ammo box special edition for waste for Wasteland 2 from the Kickstarter signed by Brian Fargo and all those guys. Like I am a, I'm a big Wasteland guy. Because uh, like you, I think of Fallout as like better than nothing Wasteland, <laughs> basically, right? Now, here's the thing. Wasteland 2 and 3, are they as good as Fallout 1 and 2? Mm, no. <laughs> like, it it's look probably like not. It. <laughs> um, but they're fun. They're good. You know, yeah. like, look, the, the Fallout world has become so fleshed out, even just through Fallout 1 and 2, let, let alone what Bethesda's done. There's a lot more to it than what's in, the, you know, the Wasteland... Uh, world in as as depicted in two and three is a little more played a little more straight uh you know fallout fallout's kind of a parody fallout's you know satire and sort of like wacky stuff happens all the time and there's some of that in wasteland two and three but like more wasteland is much more along the lines of here's a fairly realistic -y <laughs> 80s ish post-apocalyptic 
situation kind of thing. Yeah. And there's like, you know, there's people set up as, you know, wasteland Kings and like things like, you know, it, it, but it's, it's, there's some schlocky eighties, you know, Mad Max stuff in it, but you're not going to find a whole lot of wacky comedy, like in, like with fallout boy or vault boy. Well, I mean, um, technically, is, a lot of the comedy is in some can, place, places can be almost offensive. I mean, they, yeah. I mean, there's they no, really don't. There's no like equivalent no of, inside like, the Vault-Tec. lines with that franchise. Yeah. There's no Vault Tech equivalent here, although there are two um, uh, comedic mascot robot characters that pop up in the in the perk section and the and the you know the upgrade stuff. Like, but they're not like you know they're not super prominent, at least not so far. There's Scorpatrons. Scorpatrons are a big deal in Wasteland because in the original game, the hardest enemy in the game was a Scorpatron. It was just h- hanging out at the end of the Vegas Strip, and if you accidentally ran into <laughs> it, it would. If you weren't like you know, if you weren't like level fifty out of like a hundred, that thing would just rip you apart. Like it was, it was very, very dangerous. Um, so this game, so Wasteland Three, um, is a shift in perspective because the others have taken place in the desert. Um, so they, they, they took place basically in the, in the, in the original game was, uh, Vegas needles, uh, you know, kind of the Arizona, Nevada, California area, uh, wasteland two is roughly the same place. So the premise on this one, you see a lot of, you'll see a lot of snow in, in that footage. You may be like, well, where's, where's the wasteland? So, um, in the premise on this is so that yeah, what's the story behind this, the story in wasteland is basically you always play as what are called desert rangers. Um, and you're basically working out of a ranger. So you're kind of like the sort of an old West, sort of like you're the law and order or attempting to impose some kind of law and order on the post nuclear wasteland. Um, and so that you're kind of, the rangers are sort of known as sort of like, uh, they'll solve it. They'll fix it. If you can, if you can, you know, they're, they're the A team. If you, if, if you can, if you can find them and if you, if you, know, you, you know, maybe you can hire the desert rangers. And so uh, the premise on wasteland three is that they get a radio signal, a radio transmission from Colorado from someone called the patriarch. And he basically says, we need your help. And also the pro- problem is like down in the Southwest, they're running out of food, they're running out of resources, and, but they get a call and he's, he says, I will give you, I have more, I own Colorado. I, I basically have more than enough resources, but I got a problem. And if you come solve it, I will make sure your people are fed and supplied forever. Mm. So they, so they drive up what you're seeing here. They drive up to, towards Colorado, all the frozen waste that is Colorado and they are ambushed in this scene. And basically everyone in the Rangers is wiped out except for your two characters. Um, and now, when uh, you which, say two, do you play with two characters the whole game or does your party? You actually, expand? you actually play with a much larger number, but only two of your characters survive okay. this initial assault. So basically, basically this cutscene happens and then you go to a character selection screen and you can pick two, a, a number of two sets of characters. Uh, and so there's, there, I think there's a, there's a, there's two scientists who are husband and wife. Uh, there's a pair of like punk kind of road warrior looking guys who are also, uh, husband and husband. Um, there's a father and a daughter. Um, there is, uh, um, sounds like the walking dead, <laughs> a bunch of, it, it, so there's a series of two uh, pairs of characters or you can create your own. Okay. Um, and then you play through sort of a tutorial thing against the, the, this this ambushing group called the we're called the Dorseys, uh, and you don't really know who they are, but they're sort of like they seem to be kind of a post apocalyptic cult that keep talking about the deluge and, and the cleansing and fire and the blah, 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 you know very yep. far cry. Um, yep. And uh, you fight your way through it. Everybody else who's in part of your part of your squad is dead, and you find the patriarch, and the patriarch basically explains that uh, it was his fault you got ambushed. They also ambushed his town. Um, and, but you need to help him out and take these, these Dorsey guys out. And his main problem is that the patriarch is an older man, uh, who kind of runs everything. He's sort of the old, uh, the old war horse monarch of the area. And he has three children and all three of his children have gone rogue and are trying to overthrow him. And the, the, the main thrust of the game is his three children are out there planning shit and he wants you to go round them up and bring them back so he can like. So you're on a rescue you're mission, a, essentially. You're no, you're 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 on a sabotage mission. Basically. Okay. <laughs> it's an assassination, except he wants them brought in alive. Okay. Basically. And he sets you up with um, like a home base, and uh, and some advisors. And as soon as you get in the home base, uh, his advisor sets you up with. Uh, there's one guy who will come as a companion to you, uh, which is not the same as a party member. And then there will there's a guy who helps you with uh, recruitment. 
So as soon as you get in there, you can recruit more rangers and they have a bunch of pre-made rangers that have like skills like listed and you can like pick guys that sort of like, you know, match up to, you know, complement. You want a group of party, obviously, that like has a bunch of different skills. The way it works is you can have six people. Uh, four of those, four of the characters are, are player created or pre-created rangers and two of them are com- are NPC companions. Okay. Um, so you're, at maximum you can have six six characters in your party. Okay. Uh, and you do control in in battle. You do control the companions, but they can have opinions about your actions, and they can leave if they get too mad at you. So okay. the NPC, the two NPC companions, and there's tons of them. Like there's a bunch of you can rotate a lot of here. churn. You're not going to run out of them if you don't if you if you piss off too many or whatever. But those well, guys what about are like XCOM. Or, or would does it hurt when you lose some? Um, if you if it's someone you rely on, yeah, it yeah. can. Um, and uh, it's hard to lose a, a, a party member like a, a ranger permanently like there's a lot of options to get around that um but you can i think i haven't had it happen yet i haven't actually played a ton of this i've only probably played five hours um okay. so it's kind Which of like, in the grand scheme of this game probably is not much no it's, <laughs> it's really usually it's really first impressions level yeah. of this because i just haven't had that kind of time and then i got sucked into avengers and that was the end of that yeah <laughs> um but the upshot is like you can so you can so even if you don't create your own characters um, for that tutorial section, once you get to the recruitment stuff, you can create as many as you want. So you can and you you kind of have this roster sitting here, and you can recruit them into your party whenever you want, swap them out whenever you're back at base. Like it's very free and open with what you can do, and they all do level up along with the guys you have out in the field. So at some point you come so if back. They're and back can, at base, they still level up. Yeah, and there's like a lot of like pre-made characters. So there's like. Um, uh, I, I want to say there's like 20, 20 or wow. so, like pre-made okay. characters. So, so, and I pulled them back in, and they they were all level six, like I was. And then I went back and got another one. They were now level ten. Huh. The, the new okay. guy pulled. So theoretically, if you end up in the situation where like I need a specialist in this one thing, I think theoretically you can go back, pull in someone you've never used before, and just level them up into the skills that you want them to be. Yeah, and you're done. I like that. Um, so there's there's some, there's a lot of flexibility there, and of course the the base you're in. It's been abandoned. There's like alarms run. You had, to, you had to. I made friends with the robots that were there, so they all think I'm the people who are supposed to be there, so they're not going to kill me. And there's like refugees over here, and there's monsters in here, and you have to go out and recruit like a medic and a mechanic for your garage, and like you have a vehicle you drive around in, that like you can upgrade that and upgrade shields on an armor, and I like can get like guns that help you in combat, and like it transfers you around the overworld and stuff. So basically, I mean, you know, I love base building. Yep. Like I, I love being able, have, having a home base that you upgrade and hire, you know, hire people in and like you get like, oh, now as you long can as do it's this not in Fallout, right? Right. <laughs> right. No, I don't want to physically build a building, <laughs> but, I, but I like to be able to recruit to people manage. and upgrade my, uh, yeah. you know, basically expand my capabilities. By having and you go back, I like going back to that home base and like everybody's running around and doing stuff. And yeah, feels, yeah, I think everybody enjoys that. Yeah, so that's a big part of the early part of this game is sort of getting that base up and running because the the quests you have to get the the siblings, uh, the the patriarchs' kids are way above your level. You know, like it's yeah. I think like the, the 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 maximum one is something like level thirty five right now. It's it's so like, clearly those are long term goals and you've got all these other side quests to do in the meantime, and. Um, Combat is they've taken a lot of. I mean, it was it, combat is was it turn based. XCOM? Sort of combat was turn based already in um, Wasteland Two, but they've taken a lot of cues from XCOM. On, there are on vats. Um, you can mm, like select specific limbs to shoot. Um, not yet. Not so far. I thought you could. I thought mm, I saw some I trailer where they had like the arm like red or something to target. Might, the I mean, arm. you might uh, that might be a skills you can get later on. I don't have those yet. Oh, okay. Um, that might that would make sense for some of the the various like sharpshooter archetypes, but I, have, I haven't gotten that far yet. Is uh, the right combat, now? It's just right now. It's just click the guy and shoot, and you have a percentage oh. to hit, and that's it. So is it more like Fire Emblem than XCOM? Would you say? Um. No, I think I think the way uh, the percentage likelihoods and kind of the cover mechanics feel more XCOM. Okay, uh, it's not as unforgiving as XCOM. Like it's not one of those things where it's like make one wrong move and they're just gonna run you over. Right. Like I mean, unless yeah. you do something really stupid. Um, also, like there's you know melee is a more viable option in this game than in XCOM. I would say like you can there you can you buff someone's strength up enough even early on they can just run right in the middle of it and just take the hits and whack people with a wrench and you're sort of done. Um, so like I don't think it's is it's not as like expert tactics level as like XCOM two when it's like running on all full cylinder you know all cylinders or anything. 
but it's pleasantly reminiscent of XCOM is kind of the way I'd say it. Also, like it's it is an RPG first and foremost. It is not a real time. It is not a turn based strategy game. Like, do not mistake this for being like a mission driven XCOM clone. It's not. Like the combat here breaks out organically on the map you are playing the RPG on, mm-hmm. um, and you can okay. position your characters. You know, there's like circles of awareness around the enemies, so you like you don't have to. You can engage in combat and get the first shot every time if you want, because that's pretty easy to set up unless you're you got guys are actually actively looking for you. Mm-hmm. Um, you can kind of get the advantage there, um, and like, so so I wouldn't I wouldn't say like if you if you hate XCOM, don't play this because it's not that. It's not it sounds like a little versus- more user friendly. Yeah, it's not merciless TBS. It's more like we took some lessons. So yeah, okay, there you go. That's see I don't have that yet. Or if I do, I haven't used it. Could be one or the other. Yeah, that's what I was talking um, about right there. Yeah, I don't have that so far. Yeah, so I mean that looks like there's that, right? <laughs> no, that's not the standard way of playing though. Yeah. Is what I'm saying. Like that might be a special move or something. Oh, okay. Like there's there are like you can build up like special moves where you can like like precision shots and like special power shots and stuff. You can oh, okay. So that's probably what it was. I it's think a that's precision what that shot is, yeah. and they're like choose where you want to yeah, But them. again, I haven't really used a lot of that because A, I'm early on, and B, like we talked about with Avengers, I tend to not use my super abilities yep, too much. I, me know? too, man. I, I I'm the one the guy who finishes Final Fantasy with ninety nine of all the potion types. You yeah. know, this is like just in case. Yeah. I might need that later. You know. Yeah. It's the final yeah, boss. You never, no, do. I might need you it. never there might, do. There I might be say, another boss. I don't know. It's like, like Resident it. Evil. I never use the rocket launcher. I finish yep. the game and I have like full yep. rocket launcher ammo like every time. Yep, that's exactly. I'm like, I'm going to hold this till I really need it. And then suddenly I finish the game with the regular weapons. And I'm like, I guess I never really needed it then. Um, yep. Matt, did you get this on Game Pass? No. I is it on Game on, Pass? I backed this on Fig. Oh, that's right. Um, that. it, is on, uh, it is on Game Pass on Xbox and PC. Okay, um, which means you can get it for you can play it for ten bucks a month. I do know it's a full price game if you buy it retail. It is. Yeah. It's a sixty dollar game. Um, but these games are generally huge, and it's off to a pretty good start, you'd say. I think so. I mean, it is fun. It is like I said, very RPG oriented. The, the dialogue choices matter. Um, like it's not as funny as Fallout, if that's kind of the thing you like. But it is a pretty solid piece of post apocalyptic storytelling. Uh, and there is a nice sense of desperation early on because everybody's been killed. And like, um, you know, it, it feels like you're up against up against the wall. And then like, as you build the base up, it starts to feel a little more like a little more like you've got a foothold and like, it's a yeah. nice progression. Uh, and you do get attached to the characters, like the characters all have some personality. Um, it's, you know, not like tremendous, but it's like XCOM where like, you know, the characters like, you get attached to them because that's that's your sniper and she's yeah. and you the keep, best and she's saved your ass a yeah, couple you keep of times. Saving up, like, yeah. you, know, so. you keep leveling up that sniper and then suddenly the sniper's dead. And and there's some like, nice yeah. nods if you're an old Wasteland fan. I don't know how many of us are left, but like um, like one of the early side quests is like your your briefing basically says like they sent a, an advanced team up before they sent your team up and they disappeared and they were led by Angela Death, who was Here's a, here's that was this for a deep cut. Angela Death was one of the play because in the original Wasteland there were no characters, player character. You just created a character and named them whatever, and you, you know there was no personality to it. Yeah. But the strategy guide for Wasteland was a story. It was basically a it novel. provided the story. Basically, it was a no like the, so. Now that was, it was separate. A separate so, story. Separate thing. So that so oh. the, because you couldn't fit. This is how little memory you had in these old old game com, game computers. Because you couldn't fit all the text you needed for descriptions and storytelling stuff, <laughs> Wasteland, <laughs> it was literally too much to fit on the floppy disks. <laughs> you would sometimes get a thing that says, read paragraph whatever number, and it came with a little booklet that yeah. you opened to different numbered I paragraphs remember, and read that it. Wasn't and that wasn't the only was, game that did that. Yeah. 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 So it was like a choose-your-own-adventure thing, except like yeah. that. So there's a, the strategy guide was called the Wasteland Survival Guide. And it walked you through the whole game step by step, but it was written as a journal by a ranger in the field going on the same adventure that the game is about. And it had four characters with four different, you know, specific names. And Angela Death was, was one of them. the name, one of the named party members in that strategy guide. That is a deep cut. So party in the strategy guide that wasn't even in the game. And there's a you know, Hellraiser was another one, and he was in Wasteland Two as well. Yeah. Like so, they've done they did that in Wasteland Two. Like there's a, there's nods to that, but I love that. Like I love that because yeah, yeah, otherwise you wouldn't 
you wouldn't think twice about it, but I'm like, oh, I remember well, that. I would That's also crazy. argue that most of the people who are playing it will not recognize it. It's a throwback. Yeah, but like it's just little little breadcrumbs for those of us who are that old. I appreciate that. I think it's worth um, 60 bucks. I don't know if it's worth 60 bucks. It looks bucks. like an indie game to me. I mean, just I mean, it looking is. at it. It is an indie The game. production value seemed pretty minimal as far as cinematics and things like that. And no, I think the cinema, they're pretty up there as, as this kind of game goes. Like, if you, if you want, like, a like an isometric kind of turn-based RPG in, in the old Fallout style, this is kind of the only game in town. I mean, most of the games that are like this are fantasy-driven. Yeah. Um, so you have games like Disco Elysium, which... Or you know more story yeah, driven. Yeah, there's there's no really no combat in that. This yeah. is more combat focused, right? Um, but I would also say like you could just subscribe to Game Pass for a month, right? Exactly. Play it that. That's way. exactly what you should do. And if you know, obviously you have to have a PC or an Xbox to do that. But the vast majority will, of you guys do. I will also say that this is the first PC game I have played that warned me that my PC was not up to minimum. Specs. Really. And that then I came. And then I auto detected <laughs> uh, graphics settings, and it set everything to ultra. So I don't wow. know what it's talking about. It runs fine. Maybe it couldn't detect that um, you had SLI or something. It might be it. That might be it. That's but, my guess. But uh, although SLI isn't that big of a boost, so I yeah, don't know. I know. Um, I will say this: the load times are ridiculous. Uh, very, very long load. This is times, the week of awful loading which, times. Same deal with is, WRC nine. The loading's terrible there too. Which is this is uh, from what I can gather from reading about it online. This is sort of a function of Unity. Mm -hmm. um, this is just sort of like load. The, you know, load times problem. are bad unless you really optimize, and there's only so much you can do. And so that's just like, something you got to live with. The load times on Wasteland two were bad too. Um, and the, and to the, I mean, I will say that they, they seem aware of it. I don't know if there's anything they could do about it, but they seem aware of it in the sense that when you try, when you go to leave a map, it does ask you, are you sure you want to go, you want to go <laughs> leave this map? Cause yeah. like, you know, there are games that do that. And like, if you accidentally go too far to the edge of the map, you leave the map and go to a new intersection and like you didn't want to do that, but now you're stuck sitting through this load time and then you got to turn around and go back where you were. And you got to sit through the load time again. So at least this game does check that you are sure you want to go through that load screen. So yeah. props there, but it's, it's a factor. Yeah. Um, it's hard for me to recommend based upon what you said about it so far. It's hard for me to recommend a full purchase for this game, but game pass, it's a steal. Yeah. I mean, if it's, if it's your thing, if, if wasteland's your thing, if this kind of game is your thing, you're probably already playing it. Um, yeah. Cause what's it's, really it's, starting it's to hit home for me. Town. What's really starting to hit home for me is that, Game Pass is just worth subscribing to yeah, because there's much. a because at this point there's pretty much a really at least really good or really interesting game on there every month. Yeah. Um, oh, and there is a bit of fun. Uh, there is some fun satire and comedy in the sense that one of the factions you end up dealing with are called the Gippers, and they are a post-apocalyptic cult that worships Ronald Reagan. <laughs> Perfect. And that goes about <laughs> about how you'd expect. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so there you go. That's Wasteland 3. That's only PC and Xbox One. No PS4 version, right? Uh, I don't think so, not yet. And I don't think it will ever come to PS4 is my guess. I um, don't remember. I did Wasteland 2. Well, I isn't it in exile? Yes, it's in exile. Yeah, which Microsoft owns now. So. Well, I mean, Wasteland 2 did come to, to everything, pretty yep. much. Uh, I don't know if Wasteland Different 3 times will. now, though. No, Wasteland 3 is on PlayStation 4. Is it? PlayStation my guess 4, is PlayStation 4 Xbox last One. game for PS4. Could be. PlayStation 4, Xbox One, Windows, Linux, Macintosh. Yeah, because I do not see Xbox putting its games on PlayStation. <laughs> PC? Sure. PlayStation? No way. Although, you know, Microsoft weird that way. You yeah, if, there was, if one of the three would do it, it would definitely be Microsoft. Yep. That's for sure. All right, it's time to move on. We're going to talk next about Madden NFL 21. And also time for my yearly disclaimer where I explain to you guys, I'm not going to talk about this as long as we talk about most other games. I totally get it. You guys are most of you guys are not sports gamers. Although I will say this, more of you are than people think. I mean, I have no problems getting a fantasy football league going on Sifted. None. In fact, it got bigger every year until we got to 12 where we were like, we don't want more than 12. Uh, so more gamers are into sports than I think the stereotypes would suggest. And I'm definitely one of them. Mostly NFL and NHL, but I do watch some of the other stuff here and there. Um, so anyway, Matt... That, but I do think that even a lot of people I know who are gamers who like sports still don't care about sports games. A lot of them don't, yeah. Um, They'd rather would, just watch the real thing. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with that too, to be honest with you. Like, I don't really care about playing baseball video games yeah. or basketball video games. I, Although I, this year... <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's what I was getting to. So for me personally, it's tough. I don't know which is my favorite sport, whether it's NFL or NHL. I love them both a ton. And usually how the NFL season works for me is right around the end of July, I start doing like research for fantasy football. And in the first week of August, I get the same fantasy magazine I get every year. It's this process that I have gone through for literally the last like 24 years. My oldest fantasy in, league is now. In, in my experience, you get more fired up about football, but you get more depressed when things don't go your way in hockey. That's a good way to put it. I think I expect the Penguins to do better than the Steelers for whatever mm. reason. My expectations are different with the two teams, but you're right. Um, so anyway, my usual routine with that has been replicated for over two decades. I just completely ignored this year. I just didn't care. Like I didn't, again, like with this pandemic and having to stay inside all the time, you've been forced to kind of either rediscover things that you, that you used to do or find new things to do. And I had started filling what little free time I have with other stuff. And it just kind of slipped by the wayside. And like I said, at the beginning of the show, every fantasy league I'm in has just been scrambling over the last two days to get everything set up because everyone realized I didn't care about fantasy football, but now that I'm thinking about it, I do. And I want to get involved and get the season going. So I just think overall the hype for football in general has just been incredibly muted this year. There's no preseason games to start getting people excited for the NFL. See, like people don't even realize the NFL season kicks off in 10 days. The first game start in 10 days. I feel and like some people are just like waiting for it to not happen. I, I, look, you know? I'll be honest with you. Like all my fantasy leagues, we have it set up that if the season ends and it very well could end because if one team gets an outbreak, what do you do? You can't just mm -hmm. like reschedule the games or have a double header like they've been doing in baseball. Like if they've been canceling games for COVID in baseball, they're like, okay, we canceled the Pirates versus the Brewers. That's okay. Next time the Pirates come to Milwaukee, they'll just play the Brewers twice in one day. You can't do that in the NFL. You need a week of time to recover from the game before you can play another game. Um, so <laughs> An NFL doubleheader is just going to kill people. Uh, could you, people be dead, literally dead. <laughs> so you can't do it. It's a different sport. So I, I, again, I'm just explaining why Madden this year, it hasn't really landed with a lot of impact because people have just, checked out of sports and a lot of other stuff, but it's here and it did come out last Friday and I have been playing it. And if you guys have seen anything on the internet, it has been getting railed. I mean, freaking railed. It's user score average on Metacritic is like a one. I think it's critics. Metacritic is like around a five or a six right now. And over the weekend, it trended. It was like the second most trending topic on Saturday. I think that was like, take, NFL away from EA or it's been insane. Like EA has just been put through the ringer for the last like four days straight. Again, a trending topic about how bad your game is. Another thing I realized is this may be the first time where instead of the game negatively impacting the cover athlete, maybe the cover athlete negatively impacted the game because this game has been fine for like four years straight and now all of a sudden, all this crap is broken, and it is broken. Um, I have not had as many problems as the internet would suggest that I should have. I'll put it to you that way. Um, I have had all kinds of weird bugs, though. I've had times where the play ends, the player puts the ball down, everybody gets up and walks away, and the camera just stays on the ball and won't go mm -hmm. away. And in fact, when that happened... I had to completely restart the game. There was no way to get the game to pick back up again. I've had stuff like that happen. I've had achievements that I completed in Ultimate Team just act like I didn't complete them and I'd have to do them again. I've had stuff like that. Um, I haven't had like crazy game-breaking bugs like you've been seeing on tw in Twitter videos over the last four or five days. But there's still problems and there shouldn't be problems. Why are there problems? Why are there, why there are problems is because EA decided instead of this year cleaning it up and making the game complete and actually finishing it before they released it, it decided to release this brand new mode called The Yard. Now, if you're reading reviews for Madden or have been over the last few days, pretty much every review talks about how awesome The Yard is. I have no idea what the hell they're talking about. I, this mode is a piece of junk to me. It is like the worst version of NFL Blitz that you ever played because they're trying to create an arcade style experience inside God. the Madden engine. 
the, the user score on Metacritic is up 0. 0.3. That's what I was saying. Wow. It, it, it's not, it is not that bad. I'm just, I'm telling you, it's, it's, there's parts of it that are broken and it's the most buggy Madden in three or four wow. years without. I don't know if I've ever seen sub zero, like point. Sub one. Yeah. Sub yeah, one. Is I don't amazing. know if I have either. Uh, but again, like, you know, everyone's pissed off. Everyone hates EA because they have the exclusive on the license. And let's be honest, most well, of these. They, they put out like three games a year. Like you could yeah. get this one right. Like you would maybe. Think, you would think. But let's be honest. A lot of the people who are piling on on Metacritic or on social media are people who just want NFL 2K to come back. And yeah. it doesn't matter how good or bad Madden is. They're going to rail on Madden every end of August just because it's what they do. Um, but anyway, so you're seeing the yard here right now. All these goofy uniforms and outfits they're all ugly as sin i was wondering what the deal was with that it's absurd it looks so dumb all they've done is just taken five players off each side they got rid of the linemen that's it it's six on six and like your running back all of a sudden has to play like offensive line and they do incorporate some of the rules of backyard football like when you play football in the backyard, like you, you usually don't have an offensive line. So the defense has to count before they can rush. You're like one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi. Then you can rush. That's built into this. There's a little like graphic that comes up on the line of scrimmage that says, okay, now you can rush. So they built some of that stuff in there, but it plays just like Madden. There's no over the top crap happening. Like there was one time I was crossing the goal line and like the dude, like, put the football around his back as he crossed the goal line. Like, that's the extent of it. It's it's bad. I have no idea why people are so into it. It's also just mired in crazy microtransactions like Ultimate Team is. It is just another thinly camouflage way for EA to squeeze another $12 out of each person that buys the game. I don't know why people like it. I don't. I think it's a piece of trash. Now, we're looking at the new story mode called Face of the Franchise. Oh my God, Matt, what has happened to the story mode in Madden? The first one was good. Last year's was bad. And this year's is just embarrassingly abysmal. It is so awful. Definitely seems to be a step down from Mahershala. Oh my God, the writing, the voice acting, just the scenarios that they, it's so bad. It's the typical, oh, you're a high school athlete, and there's the star quarterback, and he's a jerk, but the coach likes you and gets you on the team, and then all of a sudden he finds out you're better than the starting quarterback, but also the starting quarterback has a heart condition, and should you turn him in or should you not? But if you turn him in, you're going to be the starter, and if you don't, he may die. So (laughs) that's the (laughs) plot of – that's pretty much the plot of – the face of the franchise mode. And look, eventually you go to college and Snoop Dogg shows up and it's just, it just becomes so bizarre. The graphics are terrible. Like there are decisions that you can make in it, but it makes it the graphics glitch when it goes to cut from one scene to another. There's like this weird, like jumpy frame in between them. It is, it's so bad. The other part that's bad about it is it makes you play like whole games. Like the the other ones, it would be like the starting quarter. The starting QB's hurt. We're bringing you in on the fourth quarter with three minutes left. Score a touchdown before the end of the game. That's fine. That's like a five-minute, seven-minute commitment. And this thing, they're making you play full games, like the full state championship game in high school. It, I won that game like 88 to three. <laughs> it was like 60-something to three at halftime, and they wouldn't. I had to finish the whole game. The whole second half, I just literally took a knee to make the clock run out. Like, it's bad. I don't understand again what happened with this. It was good. The first one was good. And it is just an unmitigated piece of trash now. I don't even bother. It's, I also say this. It's a lot longer than the ones that came before, which is bad because it's worse than the ones that came before. It's not good. Um, so, again, one of the things that I really liked about at least Madden a couple years ago, gone, ruined, destroyed. And they flash up all these people's names who have worked on TV shows and blah. It doesn't matter. It's garbage. These people were who, if they really did work on something that mattered, they were just mailing it in on this prod on this project. It's so bad. Um, and then just general comments about how the game plays. The game actually plays a good game of football. Like once the games start um, and you're actually in the games, it works fine. The running game feels good. One thing that I've really noticed is defensive line play has received a huge upgrade. 
And a lot of people won't care because typically when people manually control in Madden, they either play the middle linebacker or they play the free safety. I don't. I always play the down lineman. I try to get sacks because there's no bigger deal in Madden than sacks. It eats up the clock. They lose like 20 yards. So I always play as a down lineman. The tools for playing as a down lineman are like night and day now. Like it, you actually feel like you're in control. Before, you felt like you just ran into the offensive lineman and then there was like this algorithm that, that said whether you should get past him or not. Now it feels like what you do actually matters. So that is a big upgrade for me. The other thing that I've really noticed is mid-air play. So if a ball is thrown high and a bunch of players go up for it, what happens in midair is pretty freaking crazy. It, it is a complete change from how this game has been handled before. Again, if you went up before, it would first it would say, okay, who used the catch button? So if the other guy didn't and one guy did, the guy who did generally would get the catch. And then they would look at who held it longer to for, to, for a secure catch, who let it go really quickly. They're not going to get it. it. It was all numbers. Now it actually matters like who physically – does the timing right to jump up and meet the ball at its apex and then hold the catch button for that secure catch. I've seen crazy stuff in the secondary with like cornerbacks coming from the sideline, just jumping and diving over and getting like one hand on it. Like I had like two hands on the ball, knocking the ball out of my hands after I had two hands on it. again. These are huge upgrades for what's been going on in Madden for a while. But again, it's not enough. Uh, they've, they've focused too much on stuff that doesn't matter and, in their opinions, will just generate them more revenue instead of creating a game that's just going to be good so that four days after it comes out, it isn't trending on Twitter for being one of the worst video games of 2020. And it's not, by the way. It, is not, it does not deserve what it's been getting. It's not that bad. But I would never tell someone to spend 60 bucks to upgrade for Madden NFL 21. Um, and then there's the crap that comes along with the next gen version. That's the really bad part about this. This is the first entry will be for next gen consoles and it's busted broken. So I don't know what EA is thinking, Matt. Like this is this has kind of come back in the last couple of years to again be one of the best selling games every year. It went through a stage where it would only sell like a million some years. Now it's back up there where it's selling four or five million every year. And the game's getting worse. Um, so I don't know. Uh, I definitely do not recommend buying it. If you have Madden from last year, I highly recommend against it. If you haven't bought Madden in a few years, I would probably recommend waiting a couple weeks until they really get this to a good place. Uh, but again, I did not have as many problems as most people did. I played online. It played fine. Uh, I played an online franchise. That worked fine. Um just every once in a while, you just get weird glitches and bugs. And look, I've seen some of the videos on YouTube, like where the players are just like completely glitching out or like sinking into the field. I haven't seen any of that. Um, so I don't know. Uh, some of it been, may have been people playing it before a patch that maybe I got when I got it. I don't know. Uh, but it has not been as bad as people have been saying it is, but it's also not good. So, punt. <laughs> <laughs> Next up. And last, in episode 227, we're going to discuss Gamescom 2020. Although, I bulk at truly calling it that. Uh, like Maybe we should just say we're going to talk about Gamescom Opening Night Live 2020, which was Jeff Keighley's big pre-Gamescom event, but ultimately it ended up being the entirety of Gamescom, pretty much. Um, it's really all we're going to get from Gamescom. Um I will say this, Jeff did not sell it as, oh, this is going to blow your doors off. This is something you guys can't miss. I think he even said like a couple hours before it started, like, hey, don't come into this and expect your doors to get blown off, um, which I appreciate. It's very easy to be the carnival barker and just be like, this is going to be another awesome show that I put together, an exclusive, exclusive, exclusive. And he did have exclusives, but... No, world whatever. premiere. <laughs> yeah, they, they were, yeah, exactly. World premiere. None of them were up to what you would expect from like the Game Awards or even his E3 show. Um, so we're going to run through all the stuff that was announced that was worth talking about. Now, I will say this. Gamescom did happen. Oh, did it ever happen. Poor Vincent and I, man, we got hammered. Oh, there was one day... I curated from the minute I got up at like 6.30 in the morning until like 10 p.m. at night. 
I literally curated for like 14 hours. So Gamescom happened. The problem is it was just all indie stuff, literally like just a deluge of indie game announcements or new trailers for indie games. I think we created like 30 or 40 games uh, in our database on that one big day of Gamescom. So stuff was going down. It just, the, most of the stuff wasn't things that most people care about, uh, but there was. I will say I was glad to see Sable pop up, pop up again. Yeah, but that game had, that game had disappeared for like yeah. a year and a half and just mm -hmm. popped up out of nowhere. You're right. That was kind of one of the ones, and I should have put it in the rundown. I should have mentioned it. There's only really one indie game that really caught my eye from all of Gamescom. <clears throat> and I think that a lot of that is just law of diminishing returns at this point. As you more games come out, it gets harder to top those games or to come up with a unique concept. And I just where the hell, where the hell is Bio Mutant? I don't know. I, I would say that if the game was going to be canceled, if I didn't know it wasn't going to be canceled, <laughs> mm -hmm. I I don't know what's going on. They can't finish it. They just can't seem to get the game finished. I don't know. Maybe they have like some kind of a crazy terminal bug in the game that they just cannot suss out. I don't know. But what the hell? That game looked like it was done when I saw it like two years ago. I, I have no idea what's going on. So look, there was some stuff we're talking about. We're going to talk about it here on the show. But overall, definitely the weakest Gamescom ever. And that would be including the first ever Gamescom when it kind of changed over to Gamescom for the first time. And it's not a surprise. We're living in a freaking pandemic. So it makes sense that it would be slower. But boy, it was slow. Uh, the biggest thing, in my opinion, that was shown either in Jeff's show or just across Gamescom 2020 was more kind of gameplay of Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart. And basically what it is, it's another seven minutes of gameplay, but it's just replaying the same demo that they showed when they showed it off for the first time. Um, and I would also argue, too, that it the gameplay feels a little more human. If that makes sense, it mm -hmm. almost felt like when I watched that first demo that like a bot was playing the game because everything was perfect. They weren't pulling up a lot of like the weapon wheel and stuff like that. This chunk of gameplay to me feels and looks more like what it's going to be really like to play it. And wow, <laughs> it's going to be so awesome. It's crazy. Dude, it is crazy. Like when the bolts spray in this game, it, the it's mind blowing that a console can do that in real time with all the other stuff that is going on in the world. Now they did say this week that if you want to play it in 4k, you're only going to get it at 30 frames a second. Um, if you want to play it at 60, you're going to have to play it at lower resolutions or with some of the stuff turned down. But that's also been a cool revelation this week is that a lot of PlayStation five games are going to have PC like controls as far as like the visuals are concerned which I think is awesome. You'll be able to play it how you want. If you want all frame rate, you don't care about the textures, go for it. If you want your game to look gorgeous AF and you're not all that concerned about it running above 30 frames a second, you can do it. I love it. That's one of the big things I am going to love about the next generation, that part of PC games coming into it. But again, just I was just completely blown away by this demo again, all over again. And all it took was just the small variety of seeing a different player playing it, using different weapons, approaching scenarios differently. Uh, they did show, it seemed like a lot more of the Rift stuff, which is freaking awesome. Like, there's like a grapple that you use to like pull yourself into other worlds. Like, this is what, to me, this is what Next Gen is all about. It's using the tech for new paradigms in gameplay. And that's what I'm always looking for when they go to use tech. I remember when we were talking about PS4 and Xbox One, people were like, what do you want out of it? I was like, I want them to use the power for stuff that makes a difference to gameplay, like AI and things like that. Of course, that never happened. Here, it appears that it is happening. And I am very, very excited about it. Are you cool with them just kind of releasing another playthrough of the same thing, Matt? Yeah, I mean... They threw Jeff a bone, let's be honest. Pretty they, much. They helped Jeff out. Jeff was like, guys, I need something. The show's looking a little whatever... And they're like, okay, we'll play through that demo again and, and hook you up. Right. And like, yeah, I think you're right. It, it looks less, uh, for lack of a better word, tool assisted yeah. than uh, the the other version of the demo did. Yep. But like this game, honestly, this game is already at that point where I'm just like, you know what? Just give it to me. Yeah, I don't need to see any more. Like I'm, I don't need to keep seeing these things. I can't like, remember the last time that happened for me, Matt, where I saw one eight minute chunk of a game, Cyberpunk 2077. Cyberpunk. Yeah. Yep. That was, was going to say. That was the last time. Yep. So there you go. I'm putting Ratchet and Clank up on that level right now. Uh, I'm really excited about this game. Still don't know for sure when it's coming out. 
my guess is Q1 of next year, the first three months of next That's, year. It seems seems in line with what they've hinted at, yeah. Might be a little bit of wishful thinking, but who cares? <laughs> Got to put, put something on that damn console after launch. Right. It's better right. that than being a sourpuss and a Debbie Downer. Uh, next up, and I'm Matt, I'm just going to let you run with this one, Star Wars Squadrons. They showed mm -hmm. off the campaign with the lengthy trailer. How do you feel about it? I think it looks good. Like It does. Um this is a I've, game that is going to be worth 40 bucks. <laughs> yes. I have, I have very few doubts about this one, really. Me too. Um, yeah, I'm feeling real good about it. The people on it know what they're doing, uh, especially the writers. Uh, like, there's there's good pedigree here. Um, my, my friend Kat Bailey played it uh, at a preview event and came up, and basically I asked, like, you know, I love X-Wing. I love, you know, just like she does too. You know, just like mm -hmm. X-Wing, TIE Fighter. Like, I'm, yeah, EIC that's what I want. And a U.S. gamer, right? Yeah. And she, and she was like, she's like, yeah, like, she wrote a whole big article about it for us gamer that like put a lot of my concerns, you know, to rest. Yeah. I um, like her work by the way. Yeah. She's really I good. Of, I have a lot of respect for her work. She's all, she's also like one of the most informed sports people. I've I know. Ever That's the only seen. reason I love her because she loves sports as much as I do. And she loves hockey. Yeah. Maybe we were a match that just never connected. <laughs> yeah. She, um, but she, yeah, so she liked it and uh, everything I see here is good. Uh, these are all good things. Uh, these, um uh, yeah, I like the characters I'm seeing. I like that they've got Hera in there as a Rebels fan. Um the ship choices are good. Uh, I'm very curious how the uh the support ships are gonna work. You know, you got the two big support ships on each each side. You got the U Wing on the Rebels and you got the uh TIE Striker on the other. Like there, so there's gonna be a there, we got Wedge popping up. That's cool. Yep. Um it's it's great, you know, because really this kind of game, you know, has been dormant since 97 or 98. And like some of the, sometimes I see, you know, and I see the pedigree, I see that, you know, the, the controls are similar, the, but it's got like, you know, 20 years of tech to catch up on and things like just seeing like, that's you know, really the easy part though, you know, sort like, of, but like, it's just like one of the most impressive things to me is seeing some of these shots that look like they could be missions out of an old TIE fighter X-Wing game, but like, there's they look like they're also from a movie. There's blaster bolts <laughs> flying everywhere. Like they're, yeah. they're 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 busy in the way that an actual shot from the movies is busy. Yep. Um, Absolutely. So like that's great to see. I mean, again, this is sort of in the same category as Ratchet and Clank. Right, that shot there. Like that's you know, yeah. You, you could never have done that in the old games. Ever the old games were you know couldn't have done that. But here we are realizing this finally after yep. all these years. Um, like it really is in the same position that Ratchet and Clank is in the sense. It's like just give it to me. Yeah, I'm gra old. Granted, it's a month out, so it is. We're pretty close to that. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I've got a couple of friends who want to play this co-op with me that I've never played an online. Here's one. Sam ever again ever <laughs> <Here's> before. <one. laughs> um. It's so it's 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 exciting. It's it's yeah. You know, especially I'm done. because I'm sold. I don't need to see any more. I'm good. There's Hera. Hey Hera. Yeah. Um, it's cheap. It's forty bucks. It looks awesome. I, it's originally like, it's going to be a uh, you know originally going to be a, a mode in Battlefront Two, and they broke it out into be, to be its own game, which uh, is one reason it's cheap, yeah. uh, but also indicates to me that they have something special enough that they felt that EA thought it was worth you know giving it its own its own title its own thing. So I never I honestly never thought of all the things I thought EA would bring back uh, in a modern era of Star Wars games, I never thought this would be one of them. I'm it just seems game. like such a niche thing. It seems like pe it shouldn't be because people should, you know, it's like outside of being a Jedi, this is like the number two Star Wars fantasy is to fly an X-Wing yeah. or a TIE fighter. Right. Yeah. Um, and granted, you know, like that's why I was playing rogue leader to remind myself of that kind of, but again, rogue leader is a very different thing yeah. than this. Like rogue leader is an arcade game where you fly around as an X-Wing and blow shit up constantly and get judged incredibly harshly by Factor 5's <laughs> ridiculous metal qualification it really requirements. Is. What it's the so fuck is going on? I mean, what the... You're just what, now venting about those? I mean, just I was reminded of it because I because I loaded it up and like was just like... Yeah. Uh, you know, you play. I just play in the missions to play the missions and like they still give you like, oh, if you got this much more, you would have gotten a platinum medal or whatever. I'm just like... But no human can do that. What are you talking about? I had I need one to of my best friends a, could. He was I need a to demon at that game. game. I mean, I I did get like all gold medals. Did you get them my, all? On my I had a buddy who got them yeah. all. I never could. I got. I never got platinum. I was like missing like, like a couple. He what were there higher than gold? In yeah, they're platinums. Above yeah, he gold. he got the highest. All of them. All of them. 
Like, I think I, I, have, I have two platinums. That's it. Yeah, I got like no one way. platinum and like most gold minus like two or three. Like one of the one of the platinum crazy. things was like I would have had to finish the level two two minutes faster and kill sixty more enemies. <laughs> and I was like, no, no. I'm, I can't do that. That's not like, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. So yeah. those are fun. I would like to see a collection of those pop up on the Switch. Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? No. We're gonna do that. Okay. Fuck you. They um, make money. Yeah. Anything. Like, come on. Like people, those games still look great. That's they do. The part even on man, I, that's they look what I, great. I just went on a weird little GameCube jaunt, like on my, like Monday night before Avengers came went live, and like I played that. I played Rebel Strike, which, by the way, I reviewed Rebel Strike, and my retail Rebel Strike save has like three levels finished because I got all the medals on the debug version uh, and didn't want to do it again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, like, uh, and I played some Metroid Prime. Like that system still looks great. Like you, you, when you do progressive scan through the component, like that thing looks. That system is a is it's crazy. Twenty it years really later, is crazy. Twenty years later, those games still look good. It was ahead of its time. It didn't get as much love as it should have got. But yeah. anyway, um, you know, th this looks great. You know, Squadrons looks amazing. Like I'm really happy they're making it. Period. And uh, yep. I'm I'm good. You got my money. I can't need to show me anything else. Just sold for me too. Put, put it in my hands. Yep, right there with you. Next up, Doom Eternal. The Ancient Gods Part 1, the first story DLC for Doom Eternal. It picks up right after the campaign finishes, and you are pulled right back into duty to go to Erdak and clean out all the demons there as well. So <laughs> it sounds like it's just like, oh, you thought you were done. No, you're not. Here's this other new territory where you have to go and do more of the crazy stuff that you were doing to get through the base game. I like that they waited so long to release this. Look, it may have just happened that way because they couldn't finish it with COVID or whatever, but I think the timing is good because this game wore me out. Like by the time I got to the end of it, I was tired and I had had enough. I was, I was ready to take a break and they took their time getting out this first story DLC. Uh, I think it's the timing's perfect. I think it's going to reinvigorate people. The other thing about it too, is that it's standalone. So you don't have to own the base game to be able to play this, which is a big deal uh, for people who are like, oh, the game's old. I don't want to plunk down all that mm. cash. Well, you can jump right in. That is nice. DLC. I'm kind of running into a problem with that with Control because I really want to play that Alan Wake DLC, but yeah. I haven't. I never finished all the game. AWE. And I uh, I never finished the game, and then like, I loaded up my save, and I'm like, I don't remember how to do it. <laughs> anything in this game. Like, I that have game no also is idea. unique in its control scheme and yeah. it's not one of those games that just kind of copies and pastes the control scheme from Yeah, it's, it's well named. Games. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so <laughs> so I feel like I might have to start over on control and I You probably should. If that. you've only completed a couple missions, then why not? I'm know? like I'm like halfway through it. Oh but like I just don't remember how anything works anymore. If you're halfway what I through, or, I would pick up at the same. <laughs> I, I tried like a survival it's, guide or something. I, I tried. It's, it's, I also part of it's just like remembering where everything is. Yeah. And, you know, all the. Yep. That's it a is. A, it is a little mazy. Yep. But, for uh, sure. I'm excited about this DLC for Doom Eternal. I will mm -hmm. absolutely play it, and I do not play much DLC. I can tell you this: the only DLC I am ever going to play for any game is story DLC. That's all there is to it. I'm never going to care about skins or this new weapon or whatever the crap like you give me a new story dlc that's how you're going to get me interested um and bethesda typically has done a very good job with the doom franchise with its dlc i'm very confident mm -hmm. that this is going to be very polished and very fun most of their dlc is especially even for single player stuff is very like i thought they, they did a good job with the prey dlc or yeah it's hard to see how you could continue that game but like the moon crash thing actually did turn out to be a pretty cool idea yeah i i agree uh bethesda Love them or hate them over the last couple of years with what it's been doing with its IP, but there's no denying it does really good DLC and mm -hmm. typically very well valued DLC as well. Whatever it is you have to spend on it, whether it's nothing or 10 bucks, you never feel like you're getting ripped off with Bethesda DLC. And I think I also have to give Come a long that. way since horse armor. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. The most notorious of them all, the very first yeah. sort of big deal over microtransactions came from Bethesda. So it has learned some very hard lessons over the years, but it's done a pretty good job with it. I would also commend what Bethesda has done with Fallout 76. Even though the game isn't good, like it hasn't given up. It could have been very easy to just send that game off and uh, be like, oh, we screwed that one up. But Bethesda hasn't given up. So its post-launch support is pretty good. And it looks like it's going to carry through with Doom Eternal. Next, 
a game that you and I were just talking about last week saying, where the hell is it? Lego, the Skywalker saga. We finally got another look at it, only to be told it's not coming out until 2021. So I we, said I said that last week, like briefly on Lego's homepage, they they had put up a thing for this, and uh, it said coming 2021, and then they quickly pulled that down, and but then uh, they put it back up. Here, but here we are. <laughs> what the hell? Will anybody care about the content of this game by the time it comes out? I mean, Star Wars is evergreen. I um, guess. I mean, I'll still, I'll still buy it and play it. Yeah, um, I mean, I'll it looks play. really good. It's just I don't understand why it's taken years and years either. to make this. It feels like the formula should be pretty well established by now, especially since Star Wars was the first one. <laughs> like, I know, and it's TT Games. Like they can make these games in their sleep at this point. Like I don't know if they lost a lot of talent at some point or if. COVID I don't know. Has affected I, them more than a lot of other studios. I, I don't. I know. like to. I like to say it's because it's taking that long to make Rise of Skywalker into something worth playing, <laughs> um, let alone watching. But uh, I don't know. I really don't have really a theory bizarre. for you. Yep. Uh, and then next, what may have actually kind of been the biggest announcement at Jeff's thing because of the timing of it, uh, Fall Guys season two. The trailer for that was shown. Um, this game is bigger than anything right now. And so I'm sure that was a late full court press on Jeff's mm -hmm. part. It's like it blew up. He's like, oh, let's see if I can get season two into Gamescom Live. Uh, the, tra or the theme for season two is like mid medieval, like castles, but it's also, I don't know. It's like when I play that game, I don't even really notice like what a theme is because everything, it's like a unicorn, like farted all over the world. Like there's, it's just all oranges and purples and green, just these garish colors. Like, I, I don't even know what the, what is the theme for season one of Fall Guys? Is there? I don't think so. I don't I mean, either. Just, but like, I, I look just, at this and like, I would never look at these new mini games and be like, oh, they're castles. Like, I don't know. I, mean, I don't they, think it matters. There are as much as like a bouncy castle could be, a you know, it's, very kind of abstract, but okay. It's an yeah. odd choice. I don't really care, to be honest with they don't, you. They don't they have are... any... Uh, I'm sure they'll have uh, branded branded stuff coming along any, oh, any yeah. day now. You'll be able to... Yeah. I mean, all lit. that matters is that there's new courses because you do start to get sick of playing the same courses over and over. Once you get over the hump of, okay, I have it memorized now, and I'm about as good at this as luck is going to allow. Once you reach that point, that's when the game loses all its steam. So I'm just looking for new challenges and new stuff to add to it. It looks like there's going to be a lot, uh, to be honest with you. I think this is just kind of the the first pass on what they're going to have for Season 2. Um, they're also going to have a bunch of skins and other cosmetics, as you know. That's kind of the only thing you can unlock in Fall Guys. Um, it's coming um, in October, so not much long to wait. And they did say that there's going to be a Season Pass, uh, but it'll be free. And there are 40 tiers to the season pass for season two. Mm -hmm. So it looks like it's going to be pretty robust. And definitely they had this stuff in the works before it exploded because they would not have got it done this quickly. So I like that they had faith in their game from the get-go and didn't wait for it to blow up before they decided to dive in with post-launch content. So I'm sure, like like me, a lot of you guys are pretty pretty done with all the mini games in Fall Guys at this point. But we won't have to wait much longer to uh, get more. And I will absolutely go back to the game when they do release that new content. Unlike a lot of other games. Uh, next up, Destiny Two. As you guys know, Beyond Light was supposed to have come out early this year. It was delayed till November. It's still delayed till November. But Bungie is starting to show off a lot more of the content around it. The big thing that they showed during the Gamescom events was a brand new subclass called Stasis. And they showed that across three of the different core classes, the Warlock, the Hunter, and the Titan. Um, and the Stasis subclass is different depending on which main class you attach it to. Um, and then they showed one of the three so far um, as far as giving them their own trailer. And... Essentially, and that that character could turn its staff to ice. Actually, you're seeing it now. Can turn its staff to ice and then freeze enemies and shatter them, which I thought was pretty freaking awesome. So, gonna get back in for this, Matt. I mean, they're saying that this is the biggest flip flip it on its head expansion for not just Destiny Two, but for Des either of the Destiny games. Mm -hmm. 
and they're getting rid of a lot of the old content that people really love, and some people are pissed off about that. Yeah, I'm... The two things on this. First, coming out around the time of Cyberpunk, and it's yeah. just not... No. I don't know like, that they had a choice, though, with the... No, they, they're not, but, like, I'm not going to play it. Like, I don't have time for that. It's going to be right in the middle of that in Assassin's Creed, and, like, no, Destiny doesn't win that fight. Um, maybe next spring... I might give it a shot. The other thing is I really don't like what they're doing with the vaulting of the old content thing. Um, I recognize Why are they old, doing that? I don't get they it. They claim it's because it's just too big to manage at this point, but it's like, you know what? EverQuest has been running for 25 yeah, years and still has about? all the expansion. Like, you, I, you don't have to keep making, you know, Mars different all every few months. Just leave it there so leave we can it. play everything. You're leave losing your there. <laughs> you're losing like the first three campaigns of Destiny 2 because of this. That's and they crazy. say they they say they might rotate things in and out or bring things, but like you know who knows what that means. So like if you want to so play, bizarre. I think it's I think it's that I think it's the original Red War campaign, War Mind, and one other. Like if you want to play those, you better play them by September twenty second because they're going away. They're gone. Then um, you can't play the original campaign, which is weird. Like it, it was. That, a, so I, is I, this I, a, is I recognize this a situation it. We're having a physical version of the game. Might no, it help. wouldn't. It would, would never. It would not help at all because Destiny cannot be played without an oh, online right. connection. That's, See, right. that's what I mean. It doesn't matter. Doesn't yeah. matter. De a physical copy of Destiny is literally worth nothing. Yeah, like you, you it's not even worth a penny. It. Yeah, you can't play it. Um, but like, it's. I mean, it's like it's not like I want to go back and play those campaigns all that badly. But it's just like, why isn't it? And I re recognize they're trying to solve the problem where, like, if you log into Destiny Two right now, you see all these planets on the director screen and it's just confusing yeah. but that's because they haven't worked up an ai that's helpful or useful like it's like you can manage a bunch of locations god knows war, war warcraft has done it like you can do that you just have to give people a way to navigate it like and instead of doing that you're just going to pack everything away and, and simplify the screen so there's only like five planets or something but it's like yeah, and like, yeah, you can rotate out strikes and stuff, whatever. But it's like, why not just leave it legacy content there for people to play if they want to play it? Like, I don't understand what how, what kind of time or, or money that either. saves them. It's just weird. No it is really bizarre. Um, it seems like they want to refocus because I think Beyond Light would be Destiny Three in almost in another in another situation. world. Yeah, um, which cool. Like I'm, you know, slightly interested because I did like the Destiny Two campaigns more than Destiny One. Agreed. But it's just there's no. It's just so scattered and so weird. And last time I loaded the game up, I was just confused and sad. So like I probably won't bother with it until Beyond Light goes, you know, gets its first discount sale or something. You know, yep. it's yep. also very expensive. It's like yeah. seventy bucks. Yeah. So yeah. like mm, maybe it's a tough sell. Wait until you're forty, you know. And the timing, you're right, is not ideal <laughs> at all. It's probably like the worst. Was, time. Like if it was near the end of this month, I might think about it. Oh, I would like, definitely play it at the end of this yeah, month. Yeah, but in the middle of like October, November, so and the new systems and Miles Morales and Cyberpunk yeah, and Assassin's much. Creed, I'm probably not gonna be done with Watch Dogs Legion yet. Like, no. Like yeah. God knows and whatever Nintendo's putting out, we still don't know what Nintendo's gonna have out by yeah. then. You know, maybe Maybe just remasters of some things I like to play, but I still yeah, like to play. playing DLC for like a two-year-old game. Just not going to make the cut. It's just not, yeah. unfortunately. Like, it will have to have word of mouth, like, no one's business to get me to play this thing this year, basically. Yep. yep. Uh, next up, a game that surprised me in a couple of different ways, and that is Medal of Honor Above and Beyond. This is the Oculus-exclusive VR game being developed by Respawn. Um, and when you hear that, at least for me personally, the first thing I think is, oh, they're going to mail it in. It's going to be this generic shooter. There's not going to be a lot of uh, bells and whistles. It'll drop you into a level, tell you to kill everybody, and then they'll just take you to the next level. Oh, no. This is this is Respawn kind of doing a Call of Duty again, in all honesty. I was mm -hmm. shocked. They put out the story trailer or for this. Doing, um, or doing a Medal of Honor, because these are the guys right. that... Yeah. Created, you know, they did Ally Assault. Like that's yeah. where it all came from. I just think from. most people attach their name to Call of Duty, and it's been a while since they've worked on that franchise. And this is kind of Respawn's chance to get back yeah. on it. Well, it's like you forget that, like you know, they created Call of Duty because they left EA because they didn't right. like how EA was treating them on Medal of Honor, so they made another Medal of Honor and called it Call of Duty. And now they left and went back to EA. And yeah, it's bizarre. <laughs> things change the more, more they stay the same. Yep, but this game looks incredible. Like easily next to Half Life, Alex to me, one of the most full, full-fledged, full-featured VR games that I've set my eyes on. Maybe not that plain. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it is. Look, they're still making it for VR. So the models yeah. are still going to be pared down and stuff like that. But all the it, others. It just needs some rivets or something. It's a little <laughs> yeah. smooth. That's all yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. I mean, again, you, you're not going to be able to overcome the limitations of having to render something twice. That's just yeah. not going to happen. But as far as like the cinematics and the content and the scenarios, like, again, just watching this trailer, you can see there, there are parts yeah. where you're driving. There are parts where you're flying. There are parts where And you wouldn't where you're necessarily running. think this is VR, like no. watching this trailer. No, nope. so. I would. Well, I would probably think it's a mobile Call of Duty game, is what I would say. Mm -hmm. If someone just showed that to me, I'd be like, "Oh, a mobile Call of Duty with a campaign. Wow, that's a big deal." Um, and that is a big deal. A full-fledged Medal of Honor campaign for VR is a big deal. I'd, will it move the needle? Probably not. It's not going to make people run out and get Oculus all of a sudden. Um, but again, it's you know, just another arrow in that quiver to help convince people. Uh, to jump in and try Oculus. And, you know, with all the stuff that Facebook's doing now with Horizon and all that, um, it's starting to look more and more enticing to more and more people. But mm -hmm. it's still, it's still got to I mean, that's important to get them, you know, various developers to make like, you know, what we call real games yeah. for VR, like Half-Life Alex and like this. Uh, being stuck on Oculus is kind of a bummer because I don't is. have an Oculus, but uh, yeah. there's probably going to be a way to play it on on. You know, they'll trick it somehow, some, probably, yeah. or they'll just end up porting it. I don't know if Oculus paid for this. I don't know. I don't um, know if that I, was. I'm guessing they did. I mean, I had think. I mean, I haven't obviously unpacked my Vive in almost three years, but uh, there were at the time ways to get Oculus stuff from the Oculus Store to work yep. on it. So yeah. I'm sure that's still in play. Yep. Um, and then lastly, the last game that really caught my eye, and this is the one indie game I was talking about earlier, is called Lemnus Gate. Um, I, I don't even know if I can describe this game to you guys. It is so hard to explain. It is a turn-based first-person shooter strategy game where the entire game is played in 20-second loops and you can rewind and retry. And it's this very strategic game where you're trying to guess what the AI is doing because you're trying to anticipate what the AI is going to do and then move into a position where you can take advantage of it. It is undoubtedly innovative, as I'm sure you guys will all agree. It's very rare that we get innovative mechanics like this. This is one of them. It also looks pretty good from a technical perspective. It's not another one of those indie games where you're like, cool idea, but it looks like ass. It actually looks good. Um, there's not a ton of information about this game yet. Um, but again, it was slim pickings at Gamescom 2020 for stuff that actually was interesting or different or wasn't just like the fifth trailer for this indie game we've already been following for the last two years. And this, to me, was hands down the most interesting and innovative thing that was shown uh, at Gamescom 2020. Did you get a chance to check it out, Matt? No, I don't think I saw this. I, I had to go do some stuff uh, before Keeley's thing ended. Uh, so I only saw like the first hour and a half of it. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest, I'm probably describing it terribly um, as far as how it actually plays, but they haven't released like a press release about the game since it was shown. Um, mm -hmm. All we really have to go on is what's in the trailer and the cryptic description uh, that was on YouTube. So that's what we know about it so far. One thing I definitely know is that there's no other shooter like it. And to me, that's a selling point, which means that I am going to click the follow button on its game page on Sifted. So anytime something new comes out about it, it's pinned to the top of my freaking Sift. Um, and then one last note, we don't even have footage for this, but maybe worth mentioning. Sam and Max is coming back. Um, a lot of people watching this show or listening to it may be like, who the hell is Sam and Max? It's, uh, they're, a, they're, they're those telltale guys. Yeah. <laughs> That's the best way to put it, I guess. I, they are a crime-fighting animal duo that had a series of adventure games um, that were popular back in the mm -hmm. early aughts. There has not been a new Sam and Max game well, for pretty much a decade. Well, and before that, they were popular at Point and Click. That's adventure what I said, stars adventure from games. Yeah, but that, that was the 90s. Yeah. Um, the LucasArts stuff. So the Telltale right. guys re revived them from the old LucasArts days, and now I guess they're getting revived from the old Telltale days. Every, once a decade, they get brought back. Yeah, apparently. That's, it seems to be the schedule that they're on. However, I, you know, I don't care that much about Sam and Max. I don't have much of an affinity for the IP, and most of the people watching Game Face or listening to Game Face, they don't either. So... Yeah, it's, I like them. They had, I mean, they had a cartoon in the 90s. Like, yeah. they, were, they were a deal for a while. I mean, I, I, I like know one... I know one guy who was, you know, a kid in that period of time, and his like they're like his favorite thing in games. Um, although the, the old ones were like they, 
you got fans of the old LucasArts ones that sort of feel like the Telltale ones were good, but not amazing. And now I think you're going to have Telltale fans that think that the new ones are also good, but not amazing. You're sort of Xeroxing a Xerox at this point. Yep. Um, so I, look, I'm always glad to see retro IP come back, particularly when it's well handled by the developer who's working on it. Um, but I do not have a huge affinity for Sam and Mac. So I know there's some people do, so I wanted to mention it uh, before we moved on. But yeah, and it's VR only. It, I think it is coming to multiple HMDs, though. It's not an exclusive. Yeah, I don't think anyone wants an exclusive on that one. Really. <laughs> Definitely no one's going to pay for it. That's for no. sure. Um, so what what are your kind of impressions overall about Gamescom this year, Matt? Um, Giving it a pass? More, yeah. I mean, honestly, I kind of forgot it happened this week until I saw the rundown. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was, it was, I Keely. wouldn't like have remembered said, it if I didn't work my ass off curating a bunch of indie crap. It's like you said, it was <laughs> Keeley's thing, and that's about it. Like, yeah. but what are you going to do? I mean, Gamescom is very much an on site thing for the most part. So, you know, the convention at that giant, yeah. I mean, even though like, a number, a normal year, we wouldn't get anything much bigger no, than that. Not like, huge. you'll typically get like one big game debut at Gamescom, like total one big one. Mm-hmm. And then you get what we got, which is like updates to games that we really care about and a lot of stuff that you don't care about. And I think as we, you know, we have theorized that like should EA, E3, you know, collapse under its own weight, like probably a lot of those reveals would move to like a Gamescom situation. But that's in a world where Gamescom happens physically and is not canceled as a pandemic thing. Um, so Gamescom could reap some benefits in the future if EA, if E, I keep saying EA, I got <laughs> so many disappointing things that start with E in the game industry. <laughs> um, but like if, if the three becomes like kind of persona non grata, uh, it could be a thing, but I think this, because of the events of this year, it's more likely that everybody would just do their own kind of direct thing and not yeah. be tethered to these convention things anymore. I'm totally giving Gamescom a pass. In fact, I'm giving it so much of a pass that we're not even going to give it a letter grade. It's just not fair. Um, I wouldn't even know where to start, yeah. really. And look, I give Jeff a lot of props for getting this together. Um, yeah. Because it can't be easy. These these developers and publishers, they're scrambling trying to get their games done, and they're, they're not worried about getting out assets for some live stream that happens for 90 minutes. <laughs> like, and, it look, and it looked pretty good, um, yeah. presentation. Although, um, Jeff's coat didn't fit. Yeah, I noticed that. And I kept like wondering, like, did they lose his coat? And he had to wear a different <laughs> coat. Like, it felt like you know, he Jeff is very well presented. Usually, you know, he's yeah. very careful about his his uh, wardrobe appearance, and everything yeah. like that and appearance. And the, it was just it was just out of character. I thought. I, yeah, I, wonder, yeah. I just kind of wondered what happened. Well, a lot of times when I see stuff like that, Matt, I'm I'll go Google it and I'll find out that it's like the hot new thing. Like, mm. if I, like for a the while, the hot new there, thing is a coat that doesn't fit. Yes, like, <laughs> yeah. dude, for a while, the big thing was pants that were too short. Right. Like six right. months ago in LA, that was a huge thing. All these guys walking around with pants that were too short. Pants like, that are too short and no socks. Yep, and that no socks. Like, like, I'm like, what is what are wrong you doing? With you? <laughs> like, you wear loafers with no socks. You take those shoes off at the end of the day, you're gonna knock out your entire house. Yep. <laughs> Bare feet and leather, not a good combination. <laughs> So anyway, that's Gamescom 2020. Um, I, I'm I'm glad they had it. I'm impressed with what Jeff did manage to do with this show, all things considered. And I'm proud of the industry in general because they, it's all managed to somehow go forward. Some stuff here and there got delayed. Totally understandable. But I am just really proud of what the developers and the publishers have done to fight through this to make sure we keep getting great games. A couple have been delayed, but for the most part, they've kept coming, or maybe it was like a month later or something like that. Major props to the games industry. They've handled the COVID way better than just about every other industry, including our government. So props to the industry. I'm glad the Gamescom went down, and we'll expect the show to go back to its full, unfettered glory for 2021. All right. It's that time for you guys to get your questions for us into chat. And while you're doing that, here's a word from our sponsor. Do you live life outdoors? The Shazer Ryan Realty has a nice level lot just outside of Libby, Montana that's perfect for you. With access to Crystal Lake via shared dock and boat ramp, it's an ideal location to build the getaway home of your dreams or just park your RV. Enjoy fishing, paddle boarding, kayaking, boating, and more just a few steps away. It can be yours for just $72.5. No matter where you live, contact Doug DeShazer at 406-291-1643 or DeShazerMT at gmail.com. 
Even if you're not looking for property in Montana, he can connect you with local realtors in your area who can help you. If you want to see more, head over to DeShazerRyanRealty.com. That's DeShazerRyanRealty.com. Again, give Doug a call if you're looking to buy property or if you're looking to buy a house. It does not matter where you live. He can help you out if you live in California. He can help you find a home. He can help you find a realtor. He can help you find what you're looking for. Hook a sifter up. Help him out. It's time for questions. First one from ETH Demon. This is more for Matt. What's your opinion on the NVIDIA presentation yesterday? Did you see it? Didn't see it. Don't really care. Yeah, they announced their new cards. Um, I don't know why he would say this is more for Matt, but probably because I built the PC and did the PC stuff more or whatever. I mean, I, I'm, I am not in the market for new PC hardware right now. That um, actually may be why he was asking because you'd been talking about how you're you need to upgrade soon. Yeah, well, I need to. I, yeah, I'm, it's getting a little creaky, but I'm waiting until you get another another wave or two through the ray tracing cards until there's enough kind of stuff on the market to really see who's doing the best. Yeah, um, it's not the time. Is, it's not the time yet. I don't think. Yeah, crypto's version is ray tracing got cheaper. <laughs> I guess much. that's that's the best way I could put it. Um, I mean, Sessler is very impressed by it. Yeah. Um, you know, you saw him in that, and he <laughs> saw him in that briefly. Yep. Um, he even, he even trimmed the beard a little bit for that. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, it, it, cool. I, it's not relevant to me right now. Like I'll, I'll get to a new card when I get to a new card. And frankly, the, you know, that I built this thing in 2015, it's going to, I'm going to have to build an all new system like it's my pc right here 2016 and it's get yeah. is getting like now it's starting to like bog down like if i have big folders with a lot of stuff in them it takes a long time to search them and seek them and yep yeah mine still point. does my still performs just fine most of, for most of the most part but like you know it's not gonna last forever at some point i'm gonna want to play probably replay cyberpunk with all the bells and whistles turned on yep. and i'm gonna need a new system for that uh, next one, one super master gamer. What is the most that you guys are willing to pay for the next gen Xbox and PS5? Are casual people ready for more than four hundred and ninety nine US dollars? I no, will, I don't think they are. <laughs> no, I mean I will. I think they're out of their minds if it's over five hundred dollars. I agree. It like, can't be more than that. But the fact that they're waiting this long and playing chicken this hard with each other on the pricing makes me think maybe it is. And that's what they want. To, they're trying to mitigate is 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 the 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 price the sticker shock basically. Yep, I agree. I think that they just want people to to just impulse buy it. They don't want them to think. They I think they're going to yeah. announce the price and the date like maybe the week before, and they don't want people to stew on it. They won't. They don't want time for social media to chew on it and get angry. Um, that's the only rationale I can see for why this jokes is on them. That'll happen in five minutes. <laughs> I know. I know. Nah, you can't outrun that. <laughs> Japan. <laughs> like, like they don't get it, dude. They don't really understand how like social media in America works. They just really don't. Um, so anyway, let's answer this question. What's the most you guys are willing to pay? I mean, you got, you hit it 500. That's the most I'm willing to pay for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I probably, if, you know, one way or the other, I probably will pay more than that because of, you know, needs for needs for the show needs to play Miles Morales. Um, but if I didn't have to, if it wasn't like a write off for business purposes, no, like, over 500 is ridiculous. And honestly, like, I think it's a very valid question. Like, is there even a reason to buy one this year, period, if you don't need it for work or for evaluation or for whatever? I saw someone like, asking that earlier in the chat. Yeah, if, if, you don't, if you don't need it for something this year or if you're not just a giant Spider-Man nut, like... Probably not. Probably, I probably wouldn't. Yeah. Yep. Let other people kill themselves trying to get it. <laughs> Let everybody else. And they beta, will. <laughs> let us beta test it for you because it's yeah. basically what you're doing in this. Yeah, point. yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I would guess that is definitely the case. Uh, next up, also related, Commander Fett 03. What do you think about Sony making people apply to pre-order the PS5? So this was actually brought up at the end of the show last week, mm -hmm. um, and we didn't really get to talk about it too much because it was kind of we didn't really know a lot of the details around it. Blah blah blah. We obviously know all the details now. Um, did you uh, did you apply, Matt? <laughs> I mean, I yeah, I didn't get an email, but I put my you know. Yeah, I just game, went there and I put, put my, my PSN ID in. in. Yeah, yeah, I put it in. Like, but it's like, look, it's not like that's the only place you're gonna be able to pre-order one. Like, it's just it's just you're just putting yourself on another mailing list, basically. Um, but in the end, if it's another way to possibly get a pre-order at it, uh, and who knows how easy or hard it'll be to do that, 
Like, because I do think one way or the other, price or no price, the demand will outstrip the supply, at least in the initial wave. So, you know, why not? Uh, my answer is contingent on something. Um, if registering to pre to pre-order the console, which Matt and I both did, if when once you do that, they look at everyone who has pre-registered to pre-order the console and rewards the people who have been their customer their longest, I have no problem with it at all. If you're going to reward the people who have been lining your pockets for the last however many years, I'm totally cool with that. If they're taking names to cut out retailers or they're taking names to randomize who ends up getting the pre-orders, then I think it's a terrible idea. And I can't understand why they would do it. I hope that this is Sony trying to reward its loyal customers. Um, I hope that's the case. But look, Sony could be, once you give them your gamer tag, Sony could be looking at how many times has Shane shared gameplay on Twitter? How many times has he tweeted or posted on Facebook from his PS4? They may be looking at that stuff to decide who gets them because they want evangelists. They want people who are going to get the console and then spread the word all over the internet. Um, and that could be part of what they're looking at as well. I don't know. But I would say if they're looking to reward people who have been helping them out for the last 20 plus years, I'm totally cool with it. What's your perspective, man? Um, I mean, I don't really care. Like, it's just one other avenue. Uh, and that's fine. Like, if I got the opportunity to order it that way, maybe. But like, like I've said last time, I don't, I don't really trust Sony to get me that system on launch day. You know, I would yeah, rather order it from right. Amazon. You're right, show up like four days later. Like, like I know like, Amazon will get it to me that day, or I know Best Buy or Target, I could pick it up that day, or like whatever, you know, like that's, I know I'm not going to miss out on that because like, you know, but Sony doesn't have that kind of shipping, you know, I could re see reputation. like on like three days after launch, this like Mayfair 18 rig truck, drop shipment truck, showing up outside of my apartment complex and honking the horn and having to go down there and they literally just pull it off the truck and give it like that's when I think about Sony handling this that's what first jumps to my mind like I agree with you it's hard to trust that Sony would get it to you day one so it may not be all roses anyway mm -hmm. um let's see we already answered marks if you didn't have to buy the next gen consoles uh, here's one from Vincent. Are you excited for Ubisoft Forward next week? What's your hype level for Immortals Phoenix Rising? Extremely high. Mm -hmm. I like am I've... very, very excited to see Immortals Phoenix Rising, which formerly yeah. was called Gods and Monsters, for those of you who didn't get the memo yeah. this week. Which is a better title, but... Yeah, I, it's official I, now that it is called Immortals Phoenix Rising. Gods and Monsters, way better title. Yeah, but I, I wonder if they ran into trouble with the, the Ian McKellen movies being titled the same thing. Well, that's uh, my guess. Because that. look, um, it's Ubisoft. They probably want to make a movie out of this eventually. So true. If they're like, there's already a film called Gods and Monsters. We can't name our game that. Well, it so. also might be a copyright thing anyway. Yep. Like, they, know, legally, they may not be able to. Absolutely. I mean, what if you go, what if thing goes out and buys that game and they think it's going to be the James Whale biopic game and <laughs> it's not? Like, you know, where's yep. Brendan Fraser? That's yep. what everybody wants to know. Where is yeah. Brendan Fraser? To answer but, your um, question, though, I am very, very excited for this game. Yeah. I mean, I thought this game looked really cool when they first showed it, however long ago that was. And then kind of vanished. It was supposed to be out this February. Yep. And then it just sort of vanished. And it's, I guess, there seems, if they're rechanging the name, they must be sort of relaunching it a little, or reannouncing it a little bit. Yeah. Um, so hopefully it's uh, looking good and hopefully it's uh, coming soon. I can't wait. You got to realize we've only seen like 18 seconds of this game yeah. so far. <laughs> like, that's it. That's all that they've given us. So I am very excited. I mean, it looks like, you know, a Zelda game made by Ubisoft. Sign me up. I am there. Yeah, I mean, the Assassin's Creed Odyssey team making a Breath of the Wild inspired game using the Odyssey engine. Like, there could be some great stuff in here. Ding, ding, ding. It could be more. It could be Breath of the Wild if it was an actual Zelda game. Yeah. Seriously. Oh, hot take. Yeah. No. <laughs> like, uh, like, if you give me like a Zelda game with you know, a Breath of the Wild game with actual dungeons... Yeah, you got my attention. Oh, yeah, you got my money, too. Uh, Ultimate Villain, thank you for Twitch Prime. Uh, this is also a good time for you guys to subscribe with Twitch Prime. I can actually see it and thank you guys, which is awesome. Ooh, wow, there's so many questions. Holy crap, I didn't scroll down. 
We're not going to be able to get to them all, folks. We'll get to a couple more, though. Uh, Lestevid, thank you, man, for uh, gifting tier one subs. That's awesome. Um, since you did that, we'll answer your question. Lestevid, why don't we have remaster, remaster the remakes of Saturn games? Would Kickstarters work? Matt, I'll let you answer that one. Um, I think there's twofold on that. First, a lot of the code is lost. Um, so you'd have to rebuild them from the ground up or re-engineer it, like retro you know, retroactively engineer them from the, the you know, retail code, which is very difficult and annoying and time consuming. Um, and the other thing is like Saturn is not a popular system and it's, you know, correct or not, the perception is that there's not really an audience out there that would want any of that stuff. Um, would I want them? Absolutely. I would, I would pay you a hundred dollars right now for a remade remastered Panzer Dragoon Saga or Dragon Force. I would, you know, no question. Like, I would pay you double normal gaming price for a modern remake of Panzer Dragoon Saga. Everybody would. But not everybody would. That's the problem. Well, most, it's um, all the smart people would, Matt. But uh, <laughs> I think it's just because it's, it's a it's a niche system. It didn't have a whole lot of, like, really standout games uh, for most people, in most people's opinion. And it's just hard to get at it because there was no there was no proper storage or archiving done with a lot of the game code back then, especially in Japan for whatever reason. Like, um, and you know, the, the code for Panzer Gun Saga is rumored to be lost. Uh, I don't know if anybody even cares about that. That would really Force suck. Anymore. You'd have to rebuild it from the ground up anyway. Yeah. I mean, but like you could, you'd have something to base it on. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I put in, I have a Saturn hooked up right now. It's right over there on the, you know, hooked up to the plasma. And I, I loaded up uh, dragon force a few months ago and played it for like 30 hours. Like that's wow. some of that stuff's still great. Oh yeah. It still holds up. Um, Absolutely. Just the working designs catalog alone would be great to bring forward in some kind of collection, but like the interest isn't there. The, 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 the nostalgia is not there except for those of us who were, you know, the few of us who own Saturns and enjoyed them and uh, the work it would take is probably just going to cost more in terms of just paying the manpower uh, to get there than it's worth anyone to do. I mean, certainly Sega doesn't seem interested. So I think yep. we're just stuck with that. That's why that's, you know, there was a comment on uh, about the backwards compatibility uh, and the and the comments on on the article on that on Sifted, I was, I, we talked about it a little bit with uh, somebody. We're like, you know, who cares? Like the and I'm like, you know, there's other stuff that's still, you know, said who cares? All the good stuff on PS3 has already been remastered. I'm like, no, you, they, you got Somnia almost everything in yeah. almost everything Insomniac did, the Ratchet and Clanks, Future and Crack in Time, and uh, the the um the other one, Resistance. Was, Resistance. I meant the third uh, Ratchet game oh. in that trilogy. I can't the pirate one. Um, that was only digital. You remember, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, I know what you're Bo- talking Quest about. Quest for Booty. Quest for Booty. I'll be honest with you. Um, if you asked me to name the subtitles of Ratchet and Clank games, I would probably get hmm. two of them right. Uh, inf- the infamous <laughs> games. <your> arsenal. <laughs> infamous 1 and 2, the Resistance games, like you said. Um, there's a few. There's a few. You know, God of War Ascension, um, you know, the Kill Zones, like they could all be yeah. brought forward. And like someone's like, I think he's being sarcastic. I wasn't being sarcastic about any of that stuff. Like I, I don't like God of War Ascension very much. I hate the Kill Zones. Um, but like, I don't think anything should be trapped on the PS3. I don't think anything should be trapped on old systems. You should spread that stuff out, put it on multiple platforms, bring it forward. Cause otherwise you end up with situations like the Saturn where games just get lost time because yep. they're only on this one, one, you know, not the PS3 is obscure like the Saturn was, but it's a unique architecture that's hard to work with and hard to bring forward. And you end up with things that are just never going to be trapped. played by anyone who doesn't already have that original hardware. And that's a yep. shame. It is. Uh, next question from Estmont. Given the prices of the 30 series cards, he's talking about the new cards that NVIDIA just unveiled. Do you really think it's it's realistic to think that PS5 will have PC-like performance at US 500? I don't think... The cheapest card was like 500 bucks. I don't think anybody expects them to have PC-like performance. Yeah, I mean, well, define PC-like performance. I don't know what that means. Like 4K 120? Of course not. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what that means anymore. What is PC like performance now? Like, did it run the Windows? I don't know. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, don't get, I don't know. I don't know what he means. I, I think that the it's game very hard is, to. It's very hard to straight compare like hardware com- capabilities between you know specialized consoles and the more generalized PCs. Like, you're always going to get a little more out of a PC because but you're always going to spend a little more too. Yeah. Um, I mean, to answer his question, like, do I think I am going to be playing games on PS5 that look like they're being played on a high end PC for five hundred dollars? Yes, I think I am. I think I, I think we all will be playing games that look like high-end PC games on the PlayStation 5. 
Will you be able to get them to run and look better on a PC with, you know, higher end hardware? Sure. But that's always been true. What's the yes. difference? And it's always going to be that way forever. Um, People paid $600 for the PS3 for some reason. So yeah. Yeah. That thing El didn't Guapo. even run anything well. <laughs> it didn't. El Guapo 3385. Did you guys check out the Black Myth Wukong trailer? Yeah. I think I brought that up last week, actually. Yeah, I did. That looks really cool. Yeah, it does look cool. I uh, want a super master gamer. Thank you for Twitch Prime. That is flipping awesome. Um, and I think we're done with questions. Oh, one last one from List of Ed. Uh, Matt, what do you think Mulan will do? If you haven't watched uh, Turned Up Tuesday that was published yesterday, you may not realize, but Mulan is releasing on Disney Plus on Friday. You can spend $30 to rent it, but you have to be a member of Disney Plus. But once you do rent it, you have it forever in your Disney Plus account, or alternately, you can just buy it outright. So really, rent is not the... That's not the word to use. Sort of a new yeah, it's like thing. Like, Tempa buy, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know, what, I don't you, know. What, you, what word you would use. Yeah. Um, like as long as you continue to subscribe to Disney Plus, you have access you have to it, it forever. Yeah. So, you can keep, so the um, bottom line is you pay 30 bucks, you can keep watching it over and over. And your kids right. are obviously going to want to keep watching it over and over. I have no idea because we are it's in hard. completely uncharted territory with this yeah. thing. Um, I will say if they, if they can get a third of the Disney Plus subscribers to buy it, to pay that that thirty dollars, they will have made an equivalent of what you'd expect to make in the theaters on an opening in a normal opening weekend domestically. Um, except they don't have to pay the theaters half of that. So um, if this works, you will definitely see uh, Black Widow show up in the same way in November. But um, I really don't know. I have no. I, I I don't know if people will jump at thirty bucks the way they would at like twenty or twenty five. Do you know um, how the last one did? Because there was already a movie that they charged what forty for, I think. Is that right? Disney didn't. Are, not Disney, but some. There was a movie that was released where they charged like thirty to rent it or whatever. I, think, I can't remember. I can't, if there was, I don't. What Trolls was, it? was Trolls, Trolls World Tour was yeah. was twenty. Okay. Uh, and Trolls World Tour sold like crazy. It did good. Like it did extremely well. But the thing, the thing with Trolls is, and the first Trolls is like this too. It's just one of those movies that kids watch over and over and over and over. Like it was, it's one of those movies like you can turn the Trolls yeah. movie on and the kids just sit there in front of it all They're day. They're mesmerized. Like yeah. Will Mulan be the same way? I don't know because it's not a cartoon and it's it's a little different. I will say this: um, I'm not a huge proponent of the Disney live action remakes. However, as a big fan of Wuja uh, cinema, uh, this thing looks awesome. It really does. Like, yeah, I've been pretty it looks impressed really with good. Scene. And I wasn't gonna pay thirty bucks for this because I was like, ah, I don't really care about Mulan. Yeah, I've seen the cartoon version like once or twice. I'm not a huge Mulan stan. But the more I've seen the trailers for this thing, I think I have to see this. Uh, and I do also kind of want to support it because I do want Black Widow to get the same treatment so I can see a right. freaking That's Marvel true. movie at some yeah. point because I'm going crazy over here. That's smart, actually. Um, <laughs> Grease in the palms Yeah, for what so, you really want. So I don't know. Like, I really have no idea. And like, we're also looking at, uh, you know, we'll see at the end of this weekend, uh, Tenet is coming out uh, in select theaters if you're crazy enough to do that in America. I, mean, I think in yeah. Europe and internationally, it's done very well. International box office has done very well because most most places... Uh, have sort of the, the the pandemic at least not in not under control. It's not like LA where check. one in one hundred people have it, right? <laughs> so like, it's it's hard to say. Like, um, yeah, I'm interested in the tenant box office more than I am with Milan to some degree. To see how many crazy um, people there are in America. Sort of, but I mean, <laughs> just to see what kind of the, what it looks like because there's no there's no previous data for any of this. The closest yeah. we have is Bill and Ted Face the Music, which did come out in select theaters, about 2,400 screens, which is a pretty a wide release. That's a Holy standard crap. wide release. That's a standard wide release. Yeah. Um, and uh, obviously not in San Francisco and L.A. because California theaters aren't open yet. And uh, to be clear, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and New York put together is 25 to 30% of the U.S. box office. I know. Yeah. Like, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's crazy. Like, three cities make up a third of, of film yeah. goers. I, guess, I mean, that's huge. America. We'll probably make up a third so, of the population, too. So, um, the, so uh, Bill and Ted made about $7 million that opening weekend in Ooh. all those screens, which is, I mean, but that's okay for what you're dealing with. So, my guess is that Tenet, which is in a similar number of screens, I think a, a little fewer because Christopher Nolan's a little pickier about what theaters his movie plays in. Um, I would ex I would expect Tenet to make about $15 million, um, about double, a little more than double that because it is a little more of a prestige movie and people are, are Nolan fans and they'll go try that. Um, I won't, but um, 
so the question becomes like, is that enough? Is that what they want? I think you are hitting a point where the movie, the, the studios are just going to start putting these out because they got to get something on the books. Like, you know, they, like it's, it's better to have a huge bomb in the sense that no one goes to see it and be able to write that off as a pandemic expense than to like not release it at all. I think that's what you're going to run into. Uh, and then you got that 60 to 90 day window where you can maybe get tenant out in time for Thanksgiving on VOD or, or yep. HBO max or something like, yep. And also if you do this, you don't have to keep answering Christopher Nolan's phone calls, which is probably the key, <gasps> the key thing here. You just don't want to have to answer that email every day about when you're putting the IMAX version up. Um, so it's very interesting to watch that. There is a, there was a, an article I think in Vox that was called, uh, what if Hollywood decides they just don't need movie theaters anymore after this? Yeah. And it is a very interesting question. I don't have an answer for that. I don't have any, any, we just have to sort of watch and see how this unfolds because this is a paradigm shift in, in film distribution that I don't think anyone could have predicted. I think. Well, yeah, Pactor it's a pandemic. Has, well, and Pactor <laughs> has mentioned like, you know, this was coming, like this was going to happen in slow motion over the next 10 to 15 years, but now yeah. we've had, now it's going to happen over the 10 to 15 months. And I don't know what the landscape looks like at the end of this. And quite frankly, it could end up looking much better for consumers. Yeah. Uh, than any and other. For studios they can make way more yeah, money they could still. cut out the, some middlemen on that if people yeah. don't care about the theatrical experience the other thing that's interesting is uh and i say this as someone who is somewhat involved in commercial real estate situations if these theaters do go out of business if especially some of these chains the the notion of undertaking the renovation required to turn a theater building into anything, anything else, else is incredibly no, daunting. They have to, have to so they level. want yeah. another. Th so like theaters <laughs> will even if AMC say goes away, the the people who own those buildings are going to want to keep them as theaters because otherwise that's a massive renovation and no one has the money to do that. Yeah, turn them into venues this. and start having bands so and stuff. There'll be and... some of that. There'll be some, yeah. It's it's. The, it's you are in completely uncharted territory. And the thing is like, you could be another Netflix situation where whoever figures out how to do this right could hit it big and be the next paradigm. So right. there is opportunity here as, yeah, as sure. dire as it looks right now. And at the very least, if you're interested in film and box office and all that, how that works, it ain't boring. <laughs> That's <true>. Unprecedented <laughs> shit happens here every, every day, so, every day, yeah. pretty much. Yep. All right, so there you go. That's Game Face, episode 227. A couple of notes for you guys. You maybe, maybe if you joined late, a uh, reminder, Pactor Factor Live is not happening tomorrow. Uh, just another reminder, again, in case maybe you joined late. Um, we will let you know when we're rescheduling that. Um, our Fantasy Football League is completely closed off. We have 12 players to play and are drafting on Monday. And then a final note, a personal note. Your man Shane has not taken a day off work all year. I know that sounds crazy, and you may say, Shane, you're exaggerating. I am not. I have not taken a day off all year. Um, and it is Labor Day weekend this weekend. And typically, this is the one weekend where I would go away. I would fly home for a four-day weekend, do fantasy drafts with my old buddies in Philly, see my mom for a couple days, and come back. Um, obviously, that's not happening this year, but I am still taking a vacation, damn it. <laughs> hmm. So I am not going to be around on the site over Labor Day weekend. Uh, you, some of y'all will see me on Monday when we do our Sifted Fantasy Draft. Uh, but the site's going to be slow this weekend. Vincent needs to take some time off too. We have been grinding people. I don't know if you guys realize, we have not missed a week of Game Face this entire year. That is unprecedented. Um, I think COVID actually has a lot to do with it hmm. uh, because we're just, we're stuck here. So we have time to work on the show and get everything done we need to. Um, but this is, we've never done this. Usually by now we've missed at least five weeks of game face at this point of the year. So man, I've been grinding for y'all. I hope you can understand. I need some time. Like I am literally like at the end of the rope, the gamescom curation day almost broke me when it got to like nine forty PM and I was still curating. I almost lost it. So I'm taking this weekend off. I'm not going to be on the site. If you guys DM me on the site or go at me on the site, you're going to have to wait until like Tuesday for me to get back to you. I just need the time. So, and I also just want to say thank you to all you guys. Like I still sometimes have to pinch myself um, to realize that I am doing something I absolutely love to do during a pandemic and I'm staying alive doing it. Um, there's a lot of people who don't have jobs at all. Mitch, for example, he's still looking, trying to find a job. So, I just want to say I appreciate you guys very much. And I hope all you guys can go out and have a great Labor Day weekend and be safe and be fun with an emphasis on the safe part. Um, I'm not talking about you guys getting together like 20 of your bros at a kegger or anything. But uh, 
hopefully everyone can find a little bit of time to get out of quarantine and at least maybe go stand around in a yard for a little bit, 20 feet away from everybody else so that you can remember that other human beings exist because it can be very easy to forget that in these crazy times. So anyway, on behalf of Matt, who you can find on Twitter, at mkyle, um, on behalf of Jared, who's on share, shower duty this week, uh, I'm Shane Satterfield. You can find me on Twitter at Dinfire. We'll see you next Wednesday. Game face is up and out. <laughs>